Eh, itu udah Ah, Ladies and gentlemen, as we will start the meeting soon, kindly take your seat as the session will commence shortly and please switch your phone to silent mode. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as we will start the meeting soon, kindly take your seat as the session will commence shortly. And please switch your phone to silent mode. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as we will start the meeting soon, kindly take your seat as the session will commence shortly. Switch your phone to silent mode. Thank you. For online participants, kindly follow the guidance during the session. First, kindly fill a list of the attendees through the shared link in the chat room. It will be shared by uh, the admin. And please. And Okay, I repeat, kindly fill the list of attendants that will be shared by the admin through the shared link in the chat room. And please turn the camera on and keep your mic muted at the entire session. And if you have any question for the speakers or the panelists, please write down through the Q&A box. 
and proceed by the format institution dash your name. Okay, your cooperation is appreciated. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning and warmest greetings and welcome to the ASEAN workshop on Ford Industrial Revolution. Focusing on artificial intelligence implementation in energy security, agriculture, cyber security, and creative industry. My name is Dara and I will be your master of ceremony for this opening ceremony. Good morning and thank you for joining this event. One of the important agenda as mandated by the Committee on Science, Technology and Innovation COSTI is to produce the ASEAN Innovation Roadmap. This is to prepare ASEAN member states to face challenge on the fourth industrial revolution and the fifth industrial community. Organized by the National Research and Innovation Agency of the Republic Indonesia, this workshop is as part of the Indonesian government commitment for COSTI 2022, 2022 annual priorities for the fourth industrial revolution and focusing for workforce readiness and private sector's engagement. It is also a part of Indonesia contribution for the ASEAN Innovation Roadmap. Additionally, future Gunya concept paper on joint research will be developed as the result of this event. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start the remarks and greetings from the respective excellencies, I'd like to invite I repeat, ladies and gentlemen, before we start the remarks and greeting from the respective excellencies, I'd like to invite you to raise at your respective, respective location to sing the Indonesian anthem and the ASEAN anthem. Ladies and gentlemen, please all rise.
ladies and gentlemen, please have a seat. It is now time for the welcoming remarks. I'd like to invite Her Excellency, Mrs. Nur Tri Arisu Stining Tias, the Executive Secretary of the National Research and Innovation Agency of the Republic of Indonesia, or the National Costi Chairperson of Indonesia to deliver her welcoming remarks. To Ms. Nur Tri Arisu Stining Tias, screen is yours. Oke, okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good morning. His Excellency Dr. Laksana Trihandoko, Chairman of the National Research and Innovation Agency, BRIN, which will be represented by Dr. Mego Medanito, Deputy for Development Policy. His Excellency Mr. Satpinder Singh, Deputy Secretary General for ASEAN Economic Community. His Excellency Mr. Kwon Hee Siok, Ambassador of the Republic of Korea for ASEAN, His Excellency Professor Dr. Insinyur Marsudi Wahyu Kisworo, Member of the Board of the Governors of Print Indonesia, Chairman of Research Organization Electronics and Informatics, Dr. Budi Prawara and team, colleagues from the ASEAN Secretariat on STI Division at Bureau for Cooperation and Legal of Print, speakers and delegates, from ASEAN member states. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, firstly, I would like to thank the Almighty Allah for the beneficial moment. And as the National Coastal Indonesia, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to our event of the ASEAN workshop on the fourth industrial revolution, energy security, agriculture, cyber security, and creative industry. After being endorsed at the COSTI 78 meetings in 2022, and then also continued in COSTI 82-2022, Indonesia has continuously committed to organize the implementation of the workshop on the fourth industrial revolution every year until 2024. The final output of this workshop series is to establish, to establish a roadmap or framework for the development of artificial intelligence in the ASEAN region. Mr. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, since the endorsement, COSTI Indonesia has conducted three series of workshops with the main focus on the application of artificial intelligence in the various fields. Therefore, the implementation of this workshop is also known as the workshop on ASEAN AI. During its implementation in 2022, the workshop on ASEAN AI focused on the application of artificial intelligence in agriculture, cybersecurity, and energy efficiency. Meanwhile, in 2021, the focus is on the creative industry sector. Hence, this year, the ASEAN AI workshop will take under the theme of the implementation of artificial intelligence on energy security, agriculture, cyber security, and creative industry to complement the various information that has been obtained from holding the previous workshop. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, in next year, 2023, a new theme has been proposed and also has been endorsed uh, under the theme uh, artificial intelligence on uh, health. So I hope that this will be a very good result of the workshop for this year. In addition, along with the Indonesian chairmanship in the ASEAN, taking the theme of ASEAN matters epicentrum of growth, I hope this opportunity can become an initiative that drives ASEAN member states to become the centers of growth in the post pandemic era through the use of artificial intelligence in various fields. Mm -hmm. 
Last but not least, I would like to take in this great opportunity to deliver my sincere gratitude and appreciation to His Excellency Ambassador of the Republic of Korea for ASEAN for the jointly organized collaboration in the field to, to the successful of this workshop. And also to all of ASEAN member states, speakers, moderator, and ASEAN dialogue partners countries who have strongly uh, motivated to be actively participate and involved in this workshop. Thank you so much also delivered to our organizing committee of the workshop, Dr. Budi Prawara, Dr. Anto, Dr. Eri, and Ms. Nilain, all the team. This workshop could not be held without the endorsement of all AMS, great assistance from the ASEAN Secretariat, as well as the support from the Republic of Korea. Thank you so much, and I hope that our activities can bring enormous benefits for all the future of ASEAN. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Triaris Justin Tess, for your excellent remarks. Now I'd like to invite Mr. Satvinder Singh, the Deputy Secretary General for ASEAN Economic Community, to convey the welcoming remarks. To Mr. Singh, the, the screen is yours. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to all of you. Greetings from the ASEAN Secretariat. I'm extremely pleased to join all of you today at the ASEAN workshop on the fourth industrial revolution. Let me take this opportunity to first congratulate the organizer, Breen Indonesia. Thank you so much for hosting this timely event. I would also like to acknowledge the partnership from the Korean mission to ASEAN in organization of the workshop. I'm actually made to understand that this two-day workshop, it really aims to further improve the readiness of the workforce in the creative industry sector. Now, in addition, a future regional concept paper on artificial intelligence, combined research on creative industries will be developed as a result of this event. The workshop today, as you know, is also a flagship annual capacity building event by COSTI with specific focus on digital and industry 4.0 transformation. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we all know that ASEAN is well on its way towards a healthy, um, decent post-pandemic uh, economic recovery. In fact, in the first semester of 2022, we have actually witnessed some strong rebound and growth due to the gradual reopening of our markets and borders, as well as the increasing output that came from sectors such as manufacturing and services. And as a result, um, the region as a whole would be able to meet a projected growth of 5% of GDP this year, and hopefully another 5% for 2023. In fact, one of the most important contributors to the real growth that we are seeing in ASEAN today is our strong digital transformation. I think this is where in the last two years, digital transformation has changed the way we live, work, and play. In fact, there's an addition of another 70 million new digital users, making the ASEAN region one of the most fastest growing regions in the world. The resilience of the ASEAN, combined with the rapid growth of digital economy, and of course, the increasing use of smart technologies, they all have played a very important role in supporting the potential sustainable growth trajectories for ASEAN. That being said, are extremely important for us to start embracing digital technologies and the fourth industrial revolution, as it's going to be very vital for our regional sustainable growth. The ASEAN member states, as you know, are all in aspiring to transform our region into a leading digital community that's powered by a secure and a transformative digital service technologies, as well as a, a supporting ecosystem. Now, to that end, I must say that ASEAN, we have adopted numerous measures and agreements to advance Industry 4.0 transformation. For example, the member states are actively imp implementing the ASEAN Digital Master Plan 2025. They are also implementing the fourth Industrial Revolution Integrated Strategy. 
And most recently, last year, they've also embraced the Banda Sri Bhagavan roadmap on digital transformation. In this coming year for Banda, Banda Sri Bhagavan uh, roadmap, BSBR, we are going to be working firstly on initiating a common digital identity for SMEs in the ASEAN. Second, we are working also on transforming the legal regime capacities for the ASEAN member states so that they are able to recognize digital documents. As you all know, this is going to be the fundamental towards paperless trade in the future. Third, we are also working very hard on a regional digital payment connectivity among the ASEAN member states. Now, all of these efforts, these three efforts under Bandha's Sri Bhagawan Roadmap, they are all foundational efforts. These are changes that we are deploying on the ground to help prepare the region for, for our digital future. This is where the participation of all stakeholders, including the SMEs and startups, it's all going to be a very critical part of achieving this digital transformation. It's equally also very critical that we work together in building a secured, integrated, inclusive digital ecosystem. And I think this is only possible when there is a very strong public-private partnership. And this is where I think it's important that all of you who are participating here are part of this transformation and you are also invested into this transformation. Now, cognizant of the role of the multi-stakeholders, the region we are implementing the ASEAN Digital Transformation Agenda. Now, this agenda encompasses a comprehensive plan for every government, every regulator, and the private sectors in our member states to come to together. Next, we're also working on the ASEAN Digital Integration Framework Action Plan. Now, this action plan provides it complements and provides a very clear timeline and performance benchmarks, all in order to ensure a timely delivery of all of our digital initiatives. Now, this is just one of the few of the numerous regional digital action agendas that are supporting our transformation. It's also critical, I believe, for our policymakers to develop globally accepted standards to ensure interoperability between not only the different technical platforms regionally, but also the ability for us to be connected digitally across the rest of the world. In this regard, I'm also pleased to say that ASEAN, at the regional level, we have been adopting the ASEAN framework on digital data governance. Now, this is to ensure consumer and business data flows safely, securely and responsibly across the ASEAN member states. At the same time, I also have to share a good news that the economic ministers this year have also started to hasten the need for us to complete the study on scoping of a possible DEFA, a digital agreement for the ASEAN member states. Meaning to say that we are hoping that we can finish the study next year by 2023, um, first or second quarter, and hopefully sometime next year we will be able to start the negotiation of a regional digital agreement amongst the 10 ASEAN member states. Um, and I think this, this is something going to be fundamentally a critical competitive element that's going to make ASEAN economies more relevant, more useful, not only globally, but also more meaningfully um, connecting and integrating the ASEAN member states together. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, artificial intelligence, AI, it allows for definitely better decision making, improved product features, and will expand our industry's capabilities. AI is definitely, as you know, is a critical element that's applied in everyday scenario, whether you are talking about financial services, creative economy, whether it's about transformation of energy, agriculture, or even smart manufacturing. Therefore, the ASEAN capacity building on AI is going to be critical and important and it's going to help us in the ability for us to move towards this transformation digitally. I'm happy to see there's been some progress made and there's strong commitments from some of the ASEAN member states towards the implementation of all the various initiatives, including the fact that we're all meeting together here in this workshop. 
I strongly implore the private sector to come and work with us, work with us at the Secretariat so that we can coordinate your inputs and efforts that will contribute greatly to all and each of all of the 10 ASEAN member states so that we can adapt technologies into all the critical sectors that are important to our region, whether it's the agriculture, the energy, the manufacturing, or even smart services. I think this is truly an important time for us to embrace um, what I call real action so that our region is able to achieve our 4.0 transformation. In closing, I'm hoping that um, some of the conversations and the outcomes of the workshop, they could provide us a flashpoint for both ASEAN and also our dialogue partners who are listening in, particularly the Republic of Korea and of course the United States to help us to strengthen our capacities on Industry 4.0 development. I truly wish all of you a fruitful workshop and some very inspiring outcomes for us to take home. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Singh, for the excellent remarks. Now, I would like to continue the, re the welcoming remarks. Last but not least, I'd like to invite His Excellency Kwon Hesok, the Ambassador of the Republic of Korea to ASEAN, to convey his remarks. To His Excellency, the screen is yours. Thank you. Mr. Laksana Trihandoko, Chairman of the National Research and Innovation Agency, BRIN. Madam Durotri Suesti Ningtias, Executive Secretary of the National Research and Innovation Agency, BRIN. Mr. Sapinder Singh, Deputy Secretary General for ASEAN Economic Community, Excellencies, distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to extend my appreciation to all participants who have joined us today for the ASEAN workshop on the fourth industrial revolution. Let me also thank the ASEAN Secretariat and BRIN for their kind of support in organizing this workshop. In a fast paced world, digital technology is rapidly changing our lives in every field. We call this digital transformation. The most important thing in driving digital transformation is in which direction we should move. In this context, artificial intelligence has been emerging as a key driver of digital transformation. How we use AI will determine the outcome of the digital transformation. This is why we gathered today to discuss the use of AI in ASEAN for the successful digital transformation. The Republic of Korea is a country with world-class digital infrastructure and AI technology. In New York this September, President Yoon Sung yeol proposed a new digital order for realizing the future outlook of Korea's digital innovation and for preserving universal values of humanity. To specifically implement the New York Initiative, the Korean government announced the Digital Strategy of Korea. It is a pan-government plan to become a best practice country in digital innovation and to take a leap forward as a leading country in digital era rather than staying as a follower. Korea is ready fully support the acceleration of digital transformation in ASEAN and will share our experiences and best practices of digital innovation with ASEAN on priority. To this end, we will also closely work together with the other leading digital countries, including the United States. Despite the difficulties due to the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic, Digital cooperation programs between ASEAN and Korea have shown step-by-step -step progress, keeping our ties firm. Since 2020,
Korea has been conducting ASEAN Open Data Development Framework towards developing the ASEAN Open Data Dictionary and building open data platform. Also, the Cyber Shield Project, which aims to foster cybersecurity talents in ASEAN, is scheduled to start next year. In particular, since last year, ASEAN and Korea have discussed ways to further enhance digital cooperation through digital transformation webinar series. I think this webinar is even more meaningful this year as it's held in conjunction with the ASEAN AI workshop. In closing, I hope today's workshop will serve as a crucial momentum in upgrading cooperation among Korea, the United States, and ASEAN for a better digital transformation. I kindly look for your active support and constructive comments. I believe that your proactive participation will contribute to developing the digital transformation in ASEAN. Thank you. Thank you very much, His Excellency, for your outstanding yes. remarks. Well, before we continue and proceed to the officially opening uh, for the ASEAN workshop on artificial intelligence, shortly we will watch the video of Prince Prevail. Please enjoy. Research is our strength to overcome any limitations. Innovation is the guiding vision that drives us towards the future. We cannot face this alone. We must stand together to make our vision a reality. Growing strong upon the land of Nusantara, a magical place filled with miracle and wonder. A land spanning two continents and two oceans, rich in culture and biodiversity. We and Indonesia are the necessary combination to realize the grand visions of the future. Like an orchestra, Brain harmonizes research, development, assessment, application, and also synergies, invention and innovation in Indonesia. We created an ecosystem consisting of seven deputies, 12 research organizations, and 85 research centers dispersed throughout Indonesia. Research Organization for Aeronautics and Space. Research Organization for Nuclear Energy. Research Organization for Energy and Manufacture. Research Organization for Earth Sciences and Maritime. Research Organization for Life Sciences and Environment. Research Organization for Electronics and Informatics. Research Organization for Social Sciences and Humanities. Research Organization for Archaeology, Language and Literature. Research Organization for Health. Research Organization for Nanotechnology and Material. Research Organization for Agriculture and Food. Research Organization for Governance, Economy and Community Welfare. Green catalyzing research and innovation to develop an advanced scientific ecosystem in Indonesia with two main targets. Green realizes the tremendous potential of the nation's youth in the field of science and technology. Thus, various research and innovation policies are being formulated to develop and cultivate human resources with high competence and aptitude in science and technology. Creating many excellent programs is a form of brain's commitment to researchers, innovators, and the general population from various disciplines across the nation. 
research and innovation ecosystem quality improvement in Indonesia is also realized through the collaboration of various ministries, institutions, domestic industries, and regional governments, to name a few, by forming the Regional Research and Innovation Agency, or RIDA. Moreover, cooperation with various foreign research institutions continue to be developed through active participation as member of various organizations and international forums. RIN organizes research into a more effective and efficient process by integrating human resources, infrastructure, and budget from various research and development institutions. Oriented by a national research priority, BRIN routinely enacts comprehensive evaluations from various research and development institutions. This effort is supported through the continued management and improvement of various research and innovation facilities located across 17 regions of Indonesia, dedicated towards the development of science and technology. BRIN continues to improve our contribution to research and innovation towards national development by developing and revitalizing four areas of science and technology, or KST. integrated area consisting of research laboratory facilities, testing laboratories, and industrial facilities for both startups and SMEs, tenant office rooms, co-working space, meeting rooms, gallery rooms, and other supporting facilities. the future of a golden Indonesia 2045 by consolidating science and technology resources and creating a resource ecosystem and research-based economical foundation. Transforming Indonesia as a global reference in the development and application of science and technology, practices, and the good of is the source of inspiration. Knowledge is the foundation, and to be put in praxis for the sake of the nation. Innovation is the guiding vision that drives us towards the future. We cannot face this alone. We must stand together to make our vision a reality. Growing strong upon the land of Nusantara, a magical place filled with miracle and wonder. A land spanning two continents and two oceans rich in culture and biodiversity. We and Indonesia are the necessary combination to realize the grand visions of the future. Like an orchestra, Brain harmonizes research, development, assessment, application, and also synergies, invention and innovation in Indonesia. We created an ecosystem consisting of seven deputies, 12 research organizations, and 85 research centers dispersed throughout Indonesia. Research Organization for Aeronautics and Space, 
Research Organization for Nuclear Energy, Research Organization for Energy and Manufacture, Research Organization for Earth Sciences and Maritime, Research Organization for Life Sciences and Environment, Research Organization for Electronics and Informatics, Research Organization for Social Sciences and Humanities, Research Organization for Archaeology, Language and Literature, Research Organization for Health, Research Organization for Nanotechnology and Material, Research Organization for Agriculture and Food, Research Organization for Governance, Economy and Community Welfare. Bring catalyzing research and innovation to develop an advanced scientific ecosystem in Indonesia with two main targets. Green realizes the tremendous potential of the nation's youth in the field of science and technology. Thus, various research and innovation policies are being formulated to develop and cultivate human resources with high competence and aptitude in science and technology. Creating many excellent programs is a form of BRIN's commitment to researchers, innovators, and the general population from various disciplines across the nation. The research and innovation ecosystem quality improvement in Indonesia is also realized through the collaboration of various ministries, institutions, domestic industries, and regional governments, to name a few, by forming the Regional Research and Innovation Agency, or BRIDA. Moreover, cooperation with various foreign research institutions continue to be developed through active participation as member of various organizations and international forums. Green organizes research into a more effective and efficient process by integrating human resources, infrastructure, and budget from various research and development institutions. Oriented by a national research priority, Brin routinely enacts comprehensive evaluations from various research and development institutions. This effort is supported through the continued management and improvement of various research and innovation facilities located across 17 regions of Indonesia, dedicated towards the development of science and technology. Green continues to improve our contribution to research and innovation towards national development by developing and revitalizing four areas of science and technology, or KST, an integrated area consisting of research laboratory facilities, testing laboratories, and industrial facilities, or both startups and SMEs, tenant office rooms, co-working space, meeting rooms, gallery rooms, and other supporting facilities. consolidating science and technology resources and creating a resource ecosystem and research-based economical foundation. Transforming Indonesia as a global reference in the development and application of science and technology, practices, and the good of humankind. Nature is the source of inspiration Knowledge is the foundation and to be put in praxis for the sake of the nation. Okay, thank you. Can I ask your applause, please? 
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Now it is time to host the turn to welcome the official delivering to open the ASEAN workshop on fourth industrial revolution, focusing on artificial intelligence, implementation in energy security, agriculture, cybersecurity, and creative industry. And please allow me to invite the Deputy Chairman for the Development Policy of the National Research and Innovation Agency of the Republic of Indonesia, Dr. Mego Pinandito, to deliver the opening remarks, as well as to open the workshop officially. To Dr. Mego Pinandito, the screen is yours. Okay. Thank you for the can uh, hear the voice. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Apakah suaranya terdengar jelas, Bu? Yes, sir. We can hear you clearly. Okay. Uh, very good morning, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, uh, Mr. Bui Du, Deputy Minister of Science and Technology of Vietnam, uh, and same position uh, with the ASEAN Coast Chair. Excellencies, Mr. Uh, Sarvinder Singh, Deputy General, Secretary General of the ASEAN Economic Community. Excellencies, Mr. Kwong Hing Song, the Ambassador of the Republic of Korea to ASEAN. And of course, with the uh, Professor Dr. Masudi Wahyu Kiswara, member of board and the governors of the Brain Indonesia. Excellency uh, Ibu Nur, Chris uh, Arias, Swestini Kias, the executive secretary of Brain. This thing is um, delegates, speakers, and participants from the ASEAN member states on behalf of the National Research and Innovation Agency, the Republic of Indonesia. We need my honors and privilege to meet all of you today. And on behalf of uh, the chairman, I would like to welcome to all of you, you to the ASEAN workshop on the fourth industrial revolution, implementation on, of the artificial intelligence on the energy security, agriculture, and also with the cybersecurity and creative industry. As you all might uh, be known that nowadays we are facing the era of the Industrial Revolution 4.0, which overshadow the various industrial sector, indirectly requiring the every individual at the state uh, level to be able to compete the technology the development. This phenomena has the potential to create inequality between sectors are able to adapt quickly and sector that slow adapt. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, we realize that the Southeast Asia countries can work together and make collaboration with other dialogue partner uh, countries under the framework of the Association of the Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, particularly in science community, uh, committee, technology and innovation. Committee of Science, Technology, and Innovation Costi as the authorized body to manage the field of the science, technology, and innovation in ASEAN, which has strong commitment and effort in preparing the ASEAN community to face the phenomena of the technology disruption due to the fourth industrial revolutions. In order to fulfill this security, ASEAN member countries, member states agreed and set a commitment to identify the science and technology sector that funded to the answer the needs and determine the division of tasks to country that will become the country coordinating identified based on the strength and capability of each country. Therefore, in regard, in the mentioned background, Indonesia took on the commitment as well as the important role of the country coordinator for the use of the artificial intelligence technology in various sectors such as energy security, agriculture, cyber security, and of course the creative industry, which has been carried out successfully, uh, successively uh, since year of 2020 in the different teams. 
Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished speakers and participants of this ASEAN meeting. This workshop is one of the activity to collect, study, and share the best practice and also to increase the participants' uh, knowledge uh, about the various forms and also possible partnerships in the use of the artificial intelligence technology. In addition, we can strengthen the ASEAN research network relevant stakeholders also create the innovative and competitive product especially for the ai technology afterward we can formulate the policy recommendation to support the asean member country in making the national science and technology policy related to use of the artificial intelligence thus finally we hope we can produce and release an ASEAN roadmap of the artificial intelligence research and development. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to take this opportunity to extend our gratitude to all of your eagerness on in joining and actively participate in this workshop. I would also like to express my appreciation to all of the stakeholders policymakers, public officials, artificial intelligence experts and researchers, academic, and also the private sector representing the energy security, agriculture, cybersecurity, and of course with the creative industry from all of the ASEAN member states. I hope that these two days workshop program can further improve the readiness of the workforce in the artificial intelligence implementation in various sectors. Taking this opportunity, I would like to deliver my special thanks to the Ambassador of the Republic of Korea to ASEAN for joining organizing the workshop and also ASEAN Secretary for their so full support and great assistance in preparing this workshop to be successfully. As the national costi in uh, Indonesia bring fully support the ASEAN costi through the nine focal points of the subcommittees, we believe that there are many benefits could be advantage from this forum. To conclude, I officially open the ASEAN workshop on fourth industrial revolution implementation of the agri uh, artificial intelligence on energy security, agriculture, cybersecurity, and creative industry by saying Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wish you have a successful workshop and enjoy this two days workshop. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Om Santi Santi Hon. Thank you. Give me back to the MC. Terima kasih Nandito for your excellent remarks and uh, for open this uh, agenda today. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, we are going to have a photo session before we start the plenary session afterwards. Okay, uh, we're going to divide the uh, photo session into two parts. The first part, we're going to take a photo from the uh, uh, online participant. So we're going to start it page by page. Now we're going to the first page first, maybe. Please, I need your, uh, the assistant from the host. Okay, I'm counting for the first page. One, two, three. Okay, for the participant who hasn't opened the uh, video yet, could you please open the video? And we're moving to the second page. We're counting one, two, three. Okay, next page. We're counting again, one, two, three. Okay, thank you. Maybe for the rest, uh, the host could assist us as well. Okay, now uh, we're going to have a photo session for the offline participant. Um, I'd like to invite Mr. Budin Mismila first to come forward and also followed by others.
sure. And also for the current participation. Uh, mas, ya. mas izin, boleh take out kursi sebentar nggak mas? Oke, okay, there are, um, is it, is it okay? Wait, pake, pake. Listen. Maybe others could join as well. Mr. Enzo. Yeah. The speakers as well, maybe. Okay, maybe uh, put your mask off. Take off your the mask first, so we can see your face clearly. Okay, it's formal formal post. Okay, I'm counting one, two, three. Okay, next. Maybe free, freestyle post, you may. <laughs> Don't be so serious. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Bapak, mohon izin diwalikin lagi ini. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And now we are about to start the plenary session. And I would like to invite Mr. Risnander as the moderator of today's session to move to the stage, please. You may have a seat, sir. Okay. So, Mr. Uh, Risnander is. Um, finished his doctoral degree at Kumamoto University and finished his master's degree at Institute of Technology Bandung University as well as uh, at the University College London. And his um, current experience is at the Research Fellow of National Research and Innovation Agency. Uh, he also became a lecturer in Telkom University and he's a part of value-added service staff at PT Bakri Telkom ES yeah, Feb, uh, from February to April 20, uh, 2006. So, uh, Dr. Nisnander, uh, you have your time to open the session. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for uh, this uh, session. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Trisnandar. I am from the National Research and Innovation Agency, BRIN. And today I would like to be a moderator for the first plenary session in this morning. 
And you know, for the first session, we have two topics for the Asian Coast 2022. The first topic regarding the knowledge sharing by Asian member states, AMS, on key learning experience policy on develop, developing and implementing artificial intelligence on energy security, agriculture, cyber security, and creative industry. And you know, in this first session, we have six speakers from the Asian member states. The first, I would like to invite the uh, representative from the Brunei Darussalam, Dr. Lim Tiong Ho. Did you join on this session? In the Zoom meeting, maybe? Yes, I'm, 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 on, I'm on session, yes, thank you. Very much. And then the second speaker from Indonesia representative, Dr. Anto Satrio Nugroho, please coming to the front of the stage. And then the, sec, uh, the third uh, speakers from the Malaysia representative, Associate Professor Insinyur Dr. Hazlina Selamat from the Control and Mechatronic Engineering Department, Faculty of Electrical Engineering, University Technology, Malaysia. Did you join in this Zoom? Yes, hello. Oh, thank you. And then the four representative from the Myanmar, Dr. Nai Zar Aung, the director and the principal school of industrial training and education. Did you join? Yes, good morning. Okay, morning, Dr. Nai. And then the five representative from the Philippines, Mr. Eduardo Junior Piedad, SNT Fellow, Computer and Software Division, Advanced Science and Technology Institute. Did you come in? Oh yeah, thank you for joining this uh, parallel. Yes, and then the six from the Thailand, Dr. Montida Pataranan Takul, the Information Security Research Team, Communication and Network Research, Thailand. Did you join? Yes. Oh, Good thank morning. you. Good morning. And then the second topic regarding the AI policies and market trend in dialogue partners country with the Republic of Korea and USA. The first from Deputy Director of MIST Republic of Korea for the AI policy and division. Good morning. Yeah, good morning, Ms. Yeso Fak. Thank you for your coming in the online meeting. And then the last one from the USA. Mr. Kervan James, the Regional Technology Officer of U.S. Consulate General in Sydney. Did you join, Mr. James? I did. Selamat siang. Thank you all. Oh, selamat siang. Thank you. <laughs> and welcome in Zoom meeting. All right. For the first uh, information, I would like to inform you that we have 90 minutes for our discussion in the first plenary session because we have uh, eight speakers. So every speaker, we have uh, 10 minutes for presentation. And then the last one, after the total speaker uh, coming for joining in the presentation, and then after that discussion and uh, question and answer, okay? All right, for the first uh, speaker, I would like to invite to Dr. Lim Tiong Ho, the Director or Senior Assistant Professor, the Planning Development Office or Electrical and Electronic Engineering from the Brunei Darussalam. Did you come? Yeah, I'm here. Good morning. This is the first session for this time from you. The time so, yes. so can I share my slides as well? Yes, good. Yeah. So good morning, everyone. <clears throat> so I mean, we uh, today I'm going to share you a bit of our experiences, uh, especially focusing on the the where we actually use the use um, 
AI in agriculture. I mean, in Brunei itself, we actually have a lot of AI project going on. One of it is, I mean, I just attended one with today, which is actually on health. So they actually have a mobile a, mobile health systems that actually call M Health, which actually helps use AI to actually to help uh, to monitor patient records. But today I'm not going to talk about that. But I'm going to sort of focus on my my area of expertise, which is on agriculture. I, my, originally, I'm, I'm more focused on com, com, communication part as well, but today we just focus on agriculture itself. So I'm going to share the uh, my, my, my Brunei experiences, especially, especially on the benefit and challenges of AI implementations in agrotech and for sustainable architecture uh, agriculture. So during COVID, we realized that food security is one of the uh, major issues that we need to address, especially in Brunei, we're actually quite dependent on food from outside. So the government itself has actually tried to improve the food security in Brunei. So the aquaculture industry has been targeted by the fishery departments to, to contribute at least 30%, I mean, at least 20% of the overall fishery industry. So currently it only uh, contributed to 13%. And as a result of that, they also tried to have about 2,093 entrepreneurs producing 3,501.38 3, 3, metric tons of aquaculture products in 2020. So freshwater prawn is one of the uh, new areas that they, they try to venture in. So however, the, 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 the production has decreased from 9, 916 kilograms in 2018 to 884. 48 kilograms. This is actually when the, the productions of the freshwater prawn are mainly targeted for local productions. However, there's a there's a tag, there's an intention to actually to, to increase the production so that we can actually to export overseas. So currently, most of the production is low because we believe that one of the reasons why is farmers has been using traditional approach, which actually stresses the prawn. So you can see on the video here, this is one of the methods they actually use to um, to what to to monitor the growth of the product and they do this every two weeks so imagine that the the, the user has to go i mean the, the farmers actually employ people to actually to to, to fish out or net out the prawn and then take each of the prawn one by one to to actually to to measure their size and their growth and this 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 approach itself can be very stressful to the to the to the to the prawn itself eventually this will actually affect the growth and usually it also requires 24 hours for the prone to climatize itself so that it can actually uh, become grow again. So we believe, I mean, this can actually reduce the growth rate as well. And the other issues that we need want to address is also the environmental effect of agriculture and aquacultures. Agriculture, we know the agriculture environmental effect is actually quite high. So aquaculture as well also have its uh, contributions to environmental effect, especially how it actually affect water pollution, the effect of after the cultures because they have to go through four to six months of uh, aqua, uh, breeding. And after the breeding, they have to clean the, the pond again. And here we are talking about outdoor pond. Eh? We're not focusing on indoor pond. So indoor pond is much easier to control, but outdoor pond is the one that we're actually trying to address here. So as a result of that, we're trying to integrate technologies together with agriculture to improve the productions, efficiencies, the profitabilities as well so that it can actually contribute to the national GDP. So smart IoT itself has been contributed, has been used in agriculture. In Brunei, we have a lot of IoT projects, for example, to monitor the paddy growth, to monitor the water, uh, uh, water watering systems and uh, irrigation systems. And what is limited here is actually to use AI system to manage and control agriculture as well as aquacultures. And one of the projects that, that currently the, um, Ministry of Industry and Primary Resources and uh, Tourism has actually implemented is to use drone to actually to monitor the growth of the paddy. But however, what we're trying to do here is actually to use AI to actually to manage and control aquaculture uh, breeding itself. So breeding of uh, the product that we're targeting here is actually is the Macrobrachium rosa breeding, which is also known as Udangala. So one of the key issues that we need to manage here is actually is the proper pond management and feeding is actually critical, especially during the normal growth periods of the udangala, especially from the post larva to the marketable prawns. And this process can usually take five to eight months or even longer before it is ready to harvest using current technologies. I mean, using current methods, not technologies. 
And the growth of udang gala is usually highly dependent on the breeding environments and the right um, amount of time itself can, uh, can uh, the right amount and timing of the breeding can also affect it. So as a result of that, it can actually create uh, high water pollute. I mean, the, the breeding can actually, the ex excessive feeding can actually create high turbidities and also can create uh, diseases as well. So we, and then also as a result of that, we would like to use computer visions and machine learnings this way the AI can come in to actually address these issues. So, so, so another issue that we want to do is also to use AI to actually to detect the disease from the visions and machine learning. So two things that we try to look here. One is actually to use visions to monitor the growth so that we don't stress out the prone. And the other one, we actually try to use AI to actually to detect diseases. And other than that, we're going to use IoT together with AI to actually to manage the sensor reading from various water so that we can actually optimize the parameters of the prone, I mean, the prone breeding, breeding project. So one of the things that we're trying to do here is actually to provide, use AI to provide one-stop solutions here for aquacultures. So this, 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 this project can also be applied to other areas, but, but what we try to do here is actually to develop a fully AI system based on aquaculture management systems that can actually establish a conducive environment for the aquaculture's developments and growth. Um, and then we also try to use, to use the study of the population growth and the detection of mortality rates using AI and sensor technologies, and also try to increase the production rates by 20%, at least a minimum, um, a minimum of 20% using IoT and AI. So as a result of that, we want, we want to create a database and to provide a better understanding of environments as well as increase the productions and also create further research opportunities. So one of the novelty that we actually trying to uh, we have actually developed here is actually is based on the objectivity object detections algorithms uh, to actually to classify the I mean to detect the prawn itself because the prawn itself when it's under the water is can be in trouble in the group. So we want to identify the number of prawn within that particular groups. So one of the key issues as well, we need to have a GPU-based processing because we actually require high, high processing powers. Okay, we are talking about outdoor pond here again. So what we have at the moment, we have a project ongoing with, uh, with UTV, Telcom, UTM, and Brin is actually involved as well. And with UCD of York. So we actually have a support from ODE, which is basically is the, uh, the, the pond owners. Okay. And then also for the Department of Fisheries, and this is actually funded by the British Council and the ASEAN IWO funding. So what we have here is actually we're trying to use industrial-based sensor to actually to capture all the water parameters, as well as we use the underwater camera imaging to actually to capture the, the, the growth of the prone. But at the moment, you can see that underwater radio imaging camera can only detect the, based on this water quality of a tilapia fish at the moment. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to Im implement and deploy all this into a pond as big as this, okay? And the output that we expect is actually to be able to categorize the prawn itself. So this is a sample that we captured from, 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 from one, of the, one of the system that we have. And as a result of that, we also want to create a growth database as well as create an automated control breeding environments. So what are the impact of this in Brunei? So by, by having this project, we hope to actually to improve farm management okay and manage like, the productivities and the quality of the harvest using ai and data analytics and we also try to predict the annual outcome and the future development plans so that the farmers can know what can the how can the farmer plan accordingly for the productions and then we want to reduce workload and physical labor hours especially currently we we have due to covid we have issues of getting labors and we also want to increase the revenue with a lower operation cost and also to control the management and the production rates. Okay. And hopefully at the end, we want to address food security as well through a sustainable aquacultures and make all the aquaculture system in Brunei itself to be I, I, IR 4.0. Okay. And of course, we have to take into consideration the security aspect of the data that we collect. Uh, although you can say aquaculture is not very important, I mean, we don't have any critical data, but we still need to protect our, our algorithms so that our system is not being copyright by other 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 markets but of course we will welcome to share this uh, technology with other other ASEAN members partners so what we see in the challenges during our deployments so we we have a, a indoor pond and usually when we have an indoor pond when we want to go out to the outdoor world 
So they usually we observe there's a differences between a lab and real world. So even don't say lab, even if you use an indoor pond and you try to apply what you do indoor pond into real world, it can be challenging. This one we have we have a, we have a cameras which are, which actually have a very clear water quality. And over this side is is uh, is another pond where it actually after due to the uh, raining and also excessive feeding, you basically can't capture any prawn images here. So the challenge here is actually how can we actually address this. So one of the main things we intend to do is actually to first to identify the locations of the area of interest using other technology, such as uh, sauna. And then after that, move the cameras towards the, 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 the populations where the prawn is. The other issue that we face is actually is the limited resources and infrastructures. Because all this pond usually is outdoor and they usually have limited, I mean, even the next power source is, could be far away from it. So one of the issues that we have is actually we need to have a solar powered system to actually to power up all the sensor as well as the DO uh, equipments, especially the irradiators. And then also the environmental challenge. The environmental challenge itself can also affect the equipments that we use outdoor, okay? Especially the water quality. How can we actually adjust the water quality if there's too much rain? Especially in the ASEAN region, we actually experience heavy rainfall as well. That can actually affect the breeding environments. And then the most difficult one is the unwilling to adapt or accept digitizations from the farmers. I mean, this still happens because sometimes some the farmers fear this kind of technology can actually affect their, their, their growth of uh, all their productions. So they don't want to lose their profit, especially when we talk about farmers here, we're talking about small scale SME. We're not targeting the big scale farm uh, productions, F FDI investor farming, because they usually have technology to help them. But we want to help those small medium enterprise farmers to actually to help them to, to digitize their, their farm itself. So these are the few issues that we actually experience when we, we, when we, when we deploy our, our AI systems in Brunei. Okay, and I think I'll end here. I think this, if any, any questions, we can always come, uh, we can always ask me when we have the question and answer sessions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Lim Tiong Ho for your interactive uh, presentation and also topic regarding the Brunei Wawasan 20 and 35, right? Regarding yes, the automation 20, and then control AI, vision and machine, uh, machine learning to agriculture and also for aquaculture. But before we start for our uh, question and answer, maybe we will continue to the next uh, presenter until to the end of the presenter or uh, speakers. And then the second uh, speakers, I would like to invite uh, from Indonesia representative, Dr. Anto Satrio Nugroho. He come uh, for the offline uh, discussion of this topic. Please, uh, the time yours. Okay, thank you very much for time, Pak uh, Good morning, everybody. My name is Anto Satrio Nugroho. Uh, I'm from Research Center for Artificial Intelligence and Cybersecurity, National Research and Innovation Agency. Uh, my talk today, Artificial Intelligence and Cybersecurity Research. Uh, these topics are very uh, widely researched and studied. And so uh, in this topic, in, uh, in this presentation, I only pick up some of uh, research that is uh, conducted in our research centers. Next slide. Okay, uh, artificial intelligence and cybersecurity has received a lot of attention. Uh, perhaps uh, you already know that many, uh, most of us use AI and cybersecurity in most of our daily life. Access the internet using uh, WhatsApp or the other uh, tools to make it communications and also uh, <coughs> doing research in biometrics, military, and several topics. So application... Uh, the application of artificial intelligence are found in various fields such as natural language processing, such as te uh, text uh, speech recognitions, and also computer visions, 
biometrics, identification of persons based on uh, anatomical information, military and biomedical applications, and agriculture, among others. So uh, today I want to introduce some of our research activities. Uh, four topics are discussed today, cybersecurity research, and also medical dictation using speech recognition systems. It is a kind of natural language process, uh, processing applications. And the third one is uh, belonging to biometrics, identification of per a person based on uh, anatomical uh, information or behavioral information. The topics is authentication using face recognition and electronic identity card, uh, IKTP in Indonesia. And the last one is medical image processing. This topic is a collaboration between uh, our institution with many universities and uh, friends in uh, all of uh, in a lot of places in Indonesia from uh, the uh, computer scientists and also from med med medical uh, experts. Next slides. Uh, the first uh, topic is cybersecurity research. Uh, we have uh, th uh, three uh, groups in uh, these topics. The first is artificial intelligence for cybersecurity. And the second is blockchain technology. And the third group is uh, digital forensics. The artificial intelligence for uh, cybersecurity uh, use machine learning and especially deep learnings. Uh, to detect the intrusions, uh, to uh, for intrusion detection systems, and also use uh, these methods to identify spam emails and also network analysis. While the second group, uh, blockchain technology, is uh, we start from theoretical study and uh, doing uh, applications of blockchains and also uh, blockchain infrastructure using the platform Hyperledger and Ethereum. We also have a collaboration with uh, Angkasa Pura to, uh, uh, for, for the, uh, means the uh, digital, ID, digital ID of the clients. And also the last one is digital forensic, internet forensic and static and dynamic applications, security testings. Next slide. Uh, as you know that, uh, not, uh, anomaly traffic is uh, seen in uh, nowadays. That uh, this slide shows the uh, anomaly uh, traffic, national anomaly traffic in 2021. The horizontal axis shows the times uh, from January until December in 2021, and the vertical axis shows the number of attacks. And the graph shows that the number of attacks increasing from January to February, March, and so on. And the, the first peak is found in the Aprils. Uh, and it continues until the uh, December. And the total of the uh, attacks in 2021 is around 1.6 uh, billion. It shows that uh, we have to be very careful in uh, <clears throat> in using the uh, internet because many of attacks are uh, available there. Next slides. So in our research group, we use uh, machine learning and uh, intra, uh, to for the interest, uh, interaction detection systems. We, uh, of course, for this research, we have uh, data sets and machine learning and deep learning architecture, performance evaluation metrics and research infrastructure innovations. And for example, uh, this is the examples that most of the uh, computers nowadays are connected to in the internet and it is uh, protected by the firewalls. But the firewall itself is not enough because uh, we have to include uh, intrusion detection systems. There are two types of intrusion detection system using the uh, signature based identifications and the second is anomaly based identifications. Uh, uh, currently, uh, we use the uh, machine learnings to, because of the number of false positive is increasing in uh, anomaly pace. So we use several types of uh, models of neural network, for example, multilayer perceptrons and also deep learnings uh, to uh, develop a good intrusion detection, intrusion detection systems. 
Next slide. The second topic is uh, natural language processing. This is in uh, a collaboration between uh, in our institutions and Solusi 247, it is industry and harapan kita uh, hospitals as users that we want to develop medical dictation using speech recognition systems to convert the medical dictation such as diagnosis into text. This, uh, this picture show, shows the uh, outline of the systems. So doctor, the doctor uh, make a, a discussions and uh, medical dicta dictations and his sound, his voice is recognized and converted to text and saved to the, uh, to the, uh, to the storage of the uh, server of the industry and it is presented to, uh, natural, uh, to speech recognition systems in the last one <clears throat> uh, to recognize the uh, voice of the doctors and then return back the result of the recognitions to the doctor to make a, a correction if there is some say, some wrong something which is misclassified this is a uh, we conducted the uh, research in the last two years uh, 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 with hope that it can be applied uh, in the hospital, starting from Harapan, Hospital, Harapan Kita hospitals. And the systems uh, can be seen in the uh, second figure. It is the architecture. Uh, this is the uh, servers of the uh, industry. And this, uh, the second, the, grow, uh, the uh, green one is the uh, uh, speech recognition systems. Uh, and uh, it is connected to the engines of a, uh, automated speech recognition. It is all already in integrated with the EM EMR applications and uh, METIS uh, 247. It is uh, the EMR application of Solusi 247. Uh, this research also received a grant from LPDP, Indonesia Endowment uh, Fund for, uh, for Education since uh, 2020. Next slide. The third one is biometric applications. It is one examples of the uh, uh, application of artificial intelligence by using the Indonesian EID card. That uh, the card that the, all, uh, almost Indonesia has now has the EID card. Now we use the EID card uh, for authentication. <coughs> so the uh, the, <coughs> the verification is individuals is conducted by using one-to-one -one matching between biometric data and the EID chips, which is taken using smartphone camera. So uh, this one is the uh, smartphones. Uh, the, the EID card is then scanned by the smartphone and the, the picture is captured. And uh, the second picture was obtained by using the camera in the smartphone to take the picture of the persons and then doing matchings. In this matching process, uh, we use a deep learning neural network, and uh, ResNet uh, 34. Uh, it has, it should be applied. Uh, it, it is uh, used for uh, public services that requires user, EI, user uh, authentication using EID card. However, there are several changes in these topics. For the first is that different qualities of data stored inside the chips versus the data obtained by smartphone in terms of interpopulary distance, the distance between two pupils. Uh, the distance, uh, the uh, distance of, uh, of two pupils in the original EID card, uh, it is around more than 100 pixels. So it is a very good quality. But before, when it is stored to the uh, the IID chips, it is rescaled. So uh, the IPD becomes uh, around 15 to 16 uh, pixels. So there are uh, different qualities between the data stored inside chips and the data in the smartphone. And we have to do the matchings. In such situations, uh, matchings is not uh, is difficult ones. And, the, uh, and there are many uh, problems which uh, cause the uh, reductions of the accuracy, for example, intra-class yeah, caused by face poses, illumination and quality. And also uh, spoofing detection is very easy in face, so we have to deal with the problems. Also one more, 
if, if we use face for identification, aging will increase the false detection rate since the user face is already different from the original data stored in the uh, EID chips. In Indonesia, to have a EID, a person uh, when uh, he or she becomes uh, 17 years old, uh, his picture is taken and fingerprint and so on. Uh, so the picture inside of the uh, chip, uh, uh, chip uh, EID chip is when he is uh, 17 years old. So after, for example, five years, 10 years, aging become a problem because, because there is <coughs> the face of a person become changed. Yeah? So <clears throat> the accuracy become uh, will decrease. So that is the problems that should be uh, solved when we do the uh, uh, the research. Next slide. So the last one is the application of artificial intelligence in uh, medical uh, diagnosis. The objective of this topic is to develop a computer vision system to assist diagnosis of COVID nineteen from CT scan images. It is collaboration between us and doctor and several uh, friends in Indonesia. The flow is uh, can be seen from the uh, flow chart, uh, starting from raw image acquisition, CT scans, and it is uh, going to uh, pre-processing to do image enhancement and noise removals. So uh, the image is then uh, become a better quality to be processed by the next steps, which is, uh, is called as segmentation. Segmentation is uh, the separation of lung area and non-lung area. And we will focus on the no, uh, lung area itself for uh, going to the next uh, step, which is very important, feature extraction. Feature extraction try to um, uh, extract the information informations uh, the uh, the important informations of the uh, lungs, for example, uh, to identify if a person uh, satisfied uh, the uh, has the COVID nineteen or not is there are fifteen uh, features such, such as uh, ground glass opacity, consolidation, interlobular septal thickening, retic reticular pattern, and so on. And then uh this uh, this picture shows the uh, result of when we did the uh, feature extraction the yellow one is the ggo ground glass opacity and the red one is consolidation this information these two information is used to identify whether a person suffer from the uh, covid 19 or not next slide so uh, the conclusion of my talk, artificial intelligence and cybersecurity receive increasing attention, for example, on pattern recognition, computer vision, natural language processing, so with applied field of interest, security, medical, industry, and biometrics, among others. Of course, there are still many others such as bioinformatics and several topics, but we did not discuss here because of the times. Uh, also, the data are the soul of an artificial intelligence method and should be maintained carefully. And the last one, privacy should be protected and used carefully. Thank you very much your, for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Dr. Anto Satrio Nugroho from the Head of Research Center for Artificial Intelligence and Cybersecurity, the National Research and Innovation Agency, Indonesia. And this is an interactive topic regarding the cyber security and then medical dictation for the speech and voice uh, recognition, right? And then you also contribute for the COVID-19 uh, research in, in last year. <laughs> All right, uh, give applause for Mr. Dr. Anto Satrio. And then the third, uh, speaker from Malaysia representative. I would like to invite uh, for Associate Professor Insinyur Dr. Hazlina Selamat from the Control and Mechatronic Engineering Department, Faculty of Electrical Engineering, University Technology, Malaysia. Please, the time and screen yours. Dr. Hazlina? Did you join? All right. Okay. Right. Thank you. All right. Yeah. For okay, the assalamualaikum and good morning. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Morning. Waalaikum salam. Uh, so I will be sharing my presentation. Right. 
record here and also see your slide. Okay. For the 10 minutes, please. Right, thank you. Okay, can you see my slide? Yeah, we can see. Right. Okay, uh, okay uh, good morning and assalamualaikum again. I'm Hazlina from Malaysia. Um, uh, today, um, instead of going through specific projects that we uh, implement in Malaysia, uh, I'll go through generally about uh, the progress of AI in Malaysia. Details on uh, project implementation will be presented by my colleagues in the afternoon session, uh, if that's okay. All right, so um, so these are the uh, things that I would like to share with you. Uh, one is highlights of current scenario regarding AI uh, implementation in Malaysia. And I would also like to share with you um, uh, a policy document that has just been launched in August, um, which is the National AI Roadmap, where I'm part of the, um, uh, the, the task force uh, that uh, prepared the, the, the roadmap. Uh, we will also look at the challenges that we face in implementing um, uh, AI technologies in Malaysia and uh, the way forward. Right, so um, these are some of the highlights of current scenario about AI in Malaysia. Um, uh, from our um, um, observation and from our research, we found that uh, in general, numbers of AI companies in increase is increasing. So that gives an indication that adoption and acceptance to AI technologies has improved in Malaysia. Uh, for example, currently we have about 35 companies uh, that are working in uh, AI sectors. Uh, they are either companies that produce AI services or, or, or products and uh, companies that where AI is uh, the, the important aspect of their core businesses. Uh, we also have 38 startups on AI. But if we combine companies that are working on AI as well as advanced, analy advanced analytics, uh, big data analytics, and robotics, um, we have about 141 companies. Uh, we, when we talk about uh, Malaysia's rank, current rank, uh, particularly in terms of uh, government uh, AI readiness index by Oxford Insight. We are number 28 globally, number five uh, regionally, and uh, the first uh, in ASEAN, of course, excluding Singapore, which is like, you know, uh, globally is at number two or three, something like that, okay? And I will also, uh, also share with you um, a national, nationwide AI roadmap survey that we conducted in 2021 uh, as part of the process uh, in developing the national AI roadmap. And some of the AI initiatives um, at the federal government level, uh, state government level, as well as in the academia. Um, so when we conducted the nationwide AI roadmap survey um, last year, um, we have participations from um, uh, private companies. Uh, most of them are like big companies. Um, and uh, the respondents uh, also come from academia, uh, government sectors, uh, and a few other types of organizations. But generally, our finding shows that uh, in Malaysia, investment in AI is still quite low. More than 60% of the organization are spending less than 5% of their operating budget on AI. And when we ask them about the most challenging parts of implementing AI, these are the four top challenges um, that they face, okay? Most organizations face. Uh, one is expertise and knowledge. Uh, they find it quite difficult to find that. Uh, number two is finance. Mm, we know that to implement or to deploy AI systems in organization can be quite costly. And if you cannot convince uh, the um, stakeholders or the top management, it would be quite difficult to secure budgets to actually implement any AI initiatives. Um, they are also worried about, well, uh, they, they, they are feeling that data privacy concern is also another issue where people have a reservation about how their data privacy will be protected, uh, as well as resistance to change. Um, However, um, 
Um, although most organization has a generally good infrastructure, uh, indicating that they have a potential or high readiness potential. Um, most AI infrastructure and data activities are still at the initial stage. Um, companies are quite positive about, uh, well, they understand that uh, the future would be, would involve a lot of, uh, you know, the use of AI technologies and there's no going back. So they are foreseeing more than 100% uh, increase in AI talent uh, that will be needed by uh, 2025. And we could also see that uh, private sectors, you know, uh, in, uh, compared to the government sectors, are leading in many aspects of AI R&D. And this is, well, the findings actually are quite aligned with the uh, um, uh, a survey conducted or a study conducted by IDC and Microsoft on AI uh, implementation or progress in Malaysia. So we are uh, actually a bit behind in terms of data um, that is suitable for AI usage uh, as well as investments. So we can see that you know these are the areas that we have to improve. And based on these findings, um, uh, we then start preparing um, the roadmap uh, for our country. And we also uh, see that there are some AI initiatives uh, being done in Malaysia at the federal government level, state government, as well as in the academia. Uh, at the federal government level, we have uh, what we call um, High Technician Council. So that council was established um, uh, to provide uh, overarching uh, strategic directions regarding existing and emerging technologies. And um, uh, agencies like MIDA or Malaysia Investment and Development Authority, have, which is a government agency, um, start working with the Intel, which is a private sector, to uh, to have programs uh, such as AI for SMEs. And there are other initiatives that involve uh, private, uh, uh, public private partnership as well um, to boost you know, the use of uh, AI uh, among SMEs. And um, some government ministries and agencies have also started to use like things like uh, intelligent chatbots um, as part of their uh, uh, process or operation. Uh, and then at the state government level, I think um, in, our, in our observation, from our observation, we think we, we see that uh, state government are also playing active roles in ensuring uh, emerging technologies are being utilized. Uh, for example, we have uh, several states uh, embarking into these initiatives. Like we have uh, initiatives like Digital Joho 4.0 uh, for the state of Joho to be a data-driven digital economy through big data analytics and data intelligence. We have Iskanda Innovation Hub in uh, also in Johor uh, that is uh, uh, working on you know, uh, providing technologies as well as encouraging uh, setting up of, uh, for example, startups um, related to drone technologies, robotics, uh, you know, dealing with, you know, how we use technology for food security um, uh, and education um, and so on. Um, Malacca is also uh, in that direction. We have uh, Malacca Digital, we have Sarawak Digital Economy Initiatives, as well as uh, one of the most progressive uh, states uh, in technology uh, is uh, Selangor. They have Smart Selangor Action Plan 2025. And... Um, for academic and, and society, uh, I think since last year, uh, in, in 2021, we have academic programs. So the number of academic programs offered by universities has increased. Um, now, uh, from only a few of uh, universities in Malaysia offering AI programs, now we have nine universities offering uh, 10 undergraduate uh, degrees program, 19 master's program, and 11 doctoral programs in AI. We also have uh, several uh, centers of excellence, such as Center for AI and Robotics, Cairo, Center for AI Technology, um, AI and Big Data uh, uh, Group, um, and mostly are um, established in universities. 
Um, we also have talent development via uh, university industry collaborations. Um, so we, I, I know uh, some universities who are developing uh, either sorry, uh, uh, their curriculum. Sorry, Ms. Salamat, I interrupt yeah. for your time. Remain two minutes for your talk. Okay, okay. all right. It was so. limited time for presentation. Right, okay. And so uh, number two is on AI policy. We just uh, published this and the year, uh, sorry, the goal is to create a self-sustaining AI innovation ecosystem, um, leveraging quadruple helix collaboration. And we have a plan to focus, you know, different countries have different focus on how they are going to use the AI uh, to maximize, you know, their economic benefits. And for Malaysia, we feel that because of uh, our economy uh, activities, we feel that um, AI-driven supply chain would be one of the area, but we are also using AI in several uh, use cases, uh, such as in agriculture, medical, smart cities, education, and public services. And this is one of the key aspects of the policy, which is AI innovation ecosystem that we try to build in Malaysia, okay? Um, the challenges that we face include the, you know, infrastructure. Um, we have challenges in getting people to adopt, a, you know, digital, to do digital adoption, uh, especially in digitization uh, process, cloud computing adoption. And another problem is availability of highly experienced AI specialists to lead AI teams. We have many graduates, but they are very new and they require guidance. Um, and we need um, you know, senior people in AI to lead the teams. Um, confidence in AI to deliver business values. Uh, maybe we should also look at talent development. And we have yet to uh, establish ethics framework and clearer regulations on AI. And this is uh, our strategies and initiatives. Um, uh, we're focusing on several aspects uh, like governance, R&D, infrastructure, um, awareness on AI, um, AI talents, and uh, actually building the national AI innovation ecosystems. So I think that's all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Hajina. Uh, please applause for Ms. Hajina Salamat from Malaysia from the Contour and Mechatronic Engineering Department, Faculty of Electrical Engineering, University of Technology Malaysia, for the topic AI in Malaysia, for policy challenges, and also the gear up. Thank you for your talk today. Thank you. And then the fourth uh, presenter from Myanmar, representative, I would like invite for Dr. Nai Zarong, the director and principal school of industrial training and education. Please, the time and also screens yours. Okay. Uh, Sorry, I, I remind you that's your time only 10 minutes because the limited time for your uh, talk, okay? Sure, sure, just a few minutes. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank uh, you. <laughs> so good morning and Slama Paki, uh, Excellency Distinguished Guests and all participants. Good morning again. Uh, I'm Dr. Neza Al. Uh, I'm the principal of School of Industry Training and Education, SITE, from Ministry of Science and Technology, uh, Myanmar. So today I would like to take a few minutes to share about the blobby and implementing AI security, sorry, AI in energy security and agriculture in Myanmar. So I will share about AI community in Myanmar and current status of AI in energy and agriculture and also future trend, key learnings and challenges. So first we will look at the ICT growth in Myanmar. So from this chart, we can see that in 2018 data show that we have increased a lot for mobile penetration and data user in Myanmar. And also uh, the statistic that estimate that by 2030, the ICT sector could contribute 6.4 billion to Myanmar GDP and apply approximately 240 people. Also, our young generation has shown a great interest in digital solution, uh, including AI, uh, artificial intelligence. So this is the AI community in Myanmar. AI community in Myanmar is formed by young people and uh, scholar from different sectors like ICT service company, product companies, and university, research institute, and training school. So these are the, uh, the three, three, three key members of uh, AI community in Myanmar. 
And now we will move to current state of AI uh, in energy security and agriculture. First, we will look at energy security. For energy, uh, AI is popularly used for smart home, smart grid, and traditional energy demand, uh, for power theft and energy protection, uh, micro grid management, and also energy customer engagement. These are popularly used. For Myanmar, uh, it, like uh, we mostly implement smart home. So uh, not at the level of uh, a high AI, but we implement mostly smart home to control the energy and for remote control management. So these are the uh, smart home implementation apps development, mobile apps development in Myanmar, and also the reliable statistic uh, esti uh, uh, estimate that revenues in the smart home market is projected to reach 72.77 million in 2022. And also it will have a annual growth rate of 11.23% in 2026. And also the, the number of households, smart home users will grow to 0 0.9 million by 2026. So it's, it's, it can be seen that our interest in a smart home and uh, you know, energy security is growing. And also we will move to agriculture. So AI for agriculture, AI is popularly used for growth yield prediction, market price forecast, for intelligent spray, feasible CD time, and agriculture robot, probes and swine monitoring and disease diagnosis. In Myanmar, we have developed some you know, uh, AI, uh, AI integrated uh, mobile application for farmers like Greenway and also a Treto and also VL, VL, SS. Those uh, data, those apps can provide farmers data of their topography and crop C, flood monitoring, and localized weather monitoring and various probe you know, related tracking parameter. And also these apps provide information, service and data driven solution to address challenges on Myanmar agriculture and livestock farms. Also provide better connectivity for farm, farm management between the contract farming business and farmers. And also our education society, engineering university and university of computer study in our country also have, uh, you know, developing research and project related to AI, like for example, automated vehicle license plate recognition systems, smart air quality monitoring system, automated plenary no-due no detection, and also security surveillance system, natural language processing, English to Myanmar, Myanmar to English message translation, and also information retrieval system. And also there are some uh, AI, you know, uh, development in other sector, like for example, AI, to a to QXR, this is AI2 for TV detection in Hatkaya, Myanmar. And also we have, you know, a PyPy AI chatbot development in FinTech in Myanmar. So what is our key learning from, from these developments? So we have, uh, like we have learned, we need ICT growth and also investment. Uh, this the same like previous presenter and also policy for stepping into advanced technology. And also we need providing awareness on the benefits and technology nature of AI to both enterprise and customer. Sometimes enterprise and customer, they don't really understand what's the benefit. And also we need a close private public partnership for technology transfer. Sometimes we have developed, but other, our society don't know well, what is the, the, the development, how to use this. So we have to do the public private partnership for technology transfer to the society. And also we need a proper system of quality, housing and organizing the data. And also we need reliable, relevant, sufficient and non-subjected data source for AI implementation. And the last important point is AI is more successful for application intended for high-skilled people compared to low-skilled people. And our challenges today is uh, ICT literacy and ICT scale are crit critical challenges for Myanmar, which has 70% real population. And it is still a great challenge to provide QS grantee ICT infrastructure in rural area. And also it is still a great challenge to bring up the digital scale of the whole society. You know, only one side is upgrading and the other side is knowing it's also impossible to implement AI. And it is a state, it is still a great challenge to attract the willingness of SME, the same as previous presenter, you know, willingness of SME to change their business model using high tech 
due to many different barriers, including lack of qualified human resource and other you know, policy. So thank you very much. Oh, yeah. That is about our you know, uh, current state of AI implementation in Myanmar. Thank you very much, Mr. Dr. Nai Zarong from Myanmar for the topic regarding AI community and then agriculture and energy policy in Myanmar. Uh, please applause for Dr. Nai Zhang Ong. And your time is on time. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. Uh, the next uh, presenter, I would like to invite from Philippines representative, Mr. Eduardo Jr. Payadad from SNT Pillow Computer and Software Division, Advanced Science and Technology Institute, uh, Philippines. The time and screen is yours. Sorry, I remind again, your time only 10 minutes, okay? <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you well. And also my presentation, right? Can you see my presentation? Yes, we can see and good. Okay. So, well, thank you for the introduction. And uh, um, I welcome all um, the um, viewers. Um, for, for this presentation, I'd like to present to you the Industry 4.0 uh, initiatives in the Philippines at the early stage of post-pandemic and post-election period. So, so currently, I'm a, I'm one of the AI lead in the computer software division of the Advanced Science and Technology of the Department of Science and Technology. So to make this presentation very, very brief, so I uh, would like to divide the presentation to three. So they are, these are the AI initiatives the Philippines in 2021. And also recently we have, um, with the new president, we have another priority areas no, for the R&D. And lastly, I'd like to share to you the post-pandemic and post-election um, analysis of uh, the national R&D. So first, um, Let's talk about the AI in four areas that we are concerned now in this, uh, uh, in this workshop. So first in AI energy security. So among the nine listed uh, roadmaps, no, uh, national roadmaps of the Department of Science and Technology, there are two areas where uh, we have AI, no, and AI initiatives. So you can see here for the first one, the integrated program of energy efficiency and conservation, you can see that there are um, in the first and the early years, no, from 2021 to 2028. So we have um, um, AI initiatives, no? So in the Internet of Things and smart devices. For, um, for solar energy program, we also have um, forecasting models, so and also GIS integrated um, modeling, no? and in the early stage of, uh, of this new uh, national roadmap. No? And so, for the uh, AI in agriculture, so these are the roadmaps. No, it's a, a, a huge field. Uh, you have the crops, aquatic, livestock, and natural resources and environment roadmaps. You can see here the different uh, crops and different areas where AI can be applied. No, so if it's the one in the um, orange uh, products are uh, I'm actually working on, and also the one in the green in my in my team we are working on it, uh, applying GIS and uh, AI related um, studies. So. Um, let me present to you the roadmaps for smart farming and mechanization and automation. Automation. So here in smart farming, we have like the for the first years, um, we are applying data analytics and AI. Uh, although it's not um, it's not really um, emphasized no, in the different projects that you can find along the way no, in the roadmaps. For the automation part, you can also see 
the automation, um, although um, artificial intelligence is not really um, emphasized, no? although it's one of the options, um, but it's not really the priority no? uh, for the automation uh, sector. And these are some, for example, of uh, some of our researches, um, for example, for banana, and we also have for coconut. Uh, so some uh, artificial intelligence uh, researches. And let's, let me proceed to the creative industries. So uh, among the three sectors, um, uh, game, animation, and film sector has more AI initiatives. No? So let me present that one. So here you can see for the next uh, six years, seven years, you can see that uh, we have um, started already with AI initiatives. And it's more focused first in education. And later on, you will see it's more on the entertainment industry. Um, so that's for the creative industry roadmap. And for AI initiatives in general, which includes cybersecurity, because we know that uh, cybersecurity is um, embedded or integrated in many projects. So we have two roadmaps here, the AI roadmap and industry 4.0. So for AI roadmap, so this is this is the national guide, no, a roadmap that uh, shows us the different uh, initiatives no, uh, related to AI. So you can see here for the, uh, the current and the next uh, few years, you can see that uh, most of our AI initiatives focuses focused on natural language processing uh, with our local dialects because the Philippines is known for uh, um, many languages, uh, uh, dialects as well. So we have at least 300. And also IoT and robotic systems integrated in the process technology and manufacturing and also computer vision for disaster related um, uh, disaster risk uh, mitigation technologies. And for the industry 4.0, so we have uh, things um, included, um, for example, the cybersecurity, although it's not really emphasized because you know it's a product or a project based on the cybersecurity. So among uh, the first uh, part, um, we can say that AI initiatives in the Philippines focuses more on agriculture, which is quite intuitive because we are an agriculture country as well. In agriculture sector, however, AI terms were not used. This seems to be the gap between experts in the field, not only agriculture, but other fields, and also with AI practitioners. Other se sectors tend to adapt AI gradually for many reasons. Um, for creative industry, education is prioritized, no? although AI is indir indirectly or not specific. And lastly, physical and hardware-based AI initiative seems to be delayed. No? It's just due to the pandemic no? or post-pandemic adjustments in logistics and procurement processes. So let me proceed to the second uh, part of this presentation. So just very quick, we have 10 uh, priority areas because uh, we have a new president last May, and these are the, the top priorities, no? uh, national r &D. So major impact, so it would change uh, funding policies as well as prioritization of other projects. Implementation, possible modification of SNP roadmaps, and which also affects AI initiatives. And lastly, you can see that the AI initiatives also is still includes the four areas that we are concerned of. And um, emerging AI technology, you can see we have affordable healthcare and also infrastructure development. Although these are already existing, but it seems that the, the current administration is focusing on these um, technologies. And lastly, for the analysis after the pandemic, you know, we're steadily uh, moving forward. And also after the election, we can say that from the two R&D roadmaps, just a gap of one or two years, initiatives tend to be considered more gradually. And many factors of post-pandemic impact may have affected the delivery of AI initiatives from 2021 to 2028. 
and the post-election new leader directive are in the priority areas repurposes on AI initiatives accordingly, but may address the downsides of post-pandemic behavior. Second to the last, we have the new national R&D priorities may even highlight emerging technologies, as you can see earlier, healthcare advancement. And lastly, the increasing adoption of AI initiatives is directly integrated in R&D priority fields, but gradually as a general, or I mean the general AI. And that's it for my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for Mr. Piedad from Philippines for your interesting topic regarding the industry for fine oil in Philippines, uh, post uh, pandemic and post election regarding the mechanization and also automation by using AI in Philippines. Uh, please applause for Mr. Piedad from Philippines. All right, before I invite uh, the Next presenter, the sixth presenter from Thailand. I would like to remind that our presentation around uh, 10 until 12 minutes for your talk. And then for the audience, maybe you can prepare your question or comment or anything else regarding the plenary session for this topic uh, morning. <laughs> and you can also uh, give a question after this session, all right, in the last uh, minutes. And then the next presenter, I would like to invite for, from the Thailand to Dr. Montida Patanaranan Takul from the Information Security Research Team, Communication and also Network Research Thailand. The times yours, did you come? Oh. Ms. Montida or yes. Pataranan Taku? Yes, uh, let me share. Let me right. take time to share the slide, please. Yes, that's good. Yeah, please. Times and screen yours for the 10 minutes. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, can you upload my presentation? Oh, sorry. Maybe we can have. Or your okay. presentation? Did you send to us? Uh, I already sent. Oh, please, the committee, could you help us? Wait in a moment. From Thailand? Wait in a moment. <laughs> Sorry, the technical problem. A little bit. It's ready. In moment, all right. We can help you to share your talk uh, in this okay, moment. Thank you so much. All right, please. Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Montida Patara Nantakun. Uh, I am a researcher from the National Electronics and Computer Technology Center, Thailand. Uh, it is a good, great pleasure and honor to be here to to discuss you the important topic entitled Artificial Intelligence and Cybersecurity Opportunity and Challenge. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, the outline of my presentation will first give you about the introduction and we will uh, further discuss about the modern application in a, uh, artificial intelligence domains, pro and cons, uh, uh, in terms of the cybersecurity perspective when applying the artificial intelligence and the conclusion uh, will be discussed in the last presentation. Next slide. Okay, uh, 
According to the history, the industrial revolution has begun from the transition from the creating from uh, creating good from hands to the machine. So, um, as we can see from the figure, the industrial uh, the the history of the in industry has been first uh, come at the 19th century at the the first one is the industry. 1.0, which aim to use the water and stream to mechanize the production. Uh, the second is the industry for uh, 2.0, which aim to use the electric energy and oil to create ma mass production process. For the industry 3.0, which refer to the digital revolution, uh, is the first computer era which is applied and use the computer and electronic to bring uh, industry automation. Uh, the last one is the industry 4.0, which is known as cyber physical system, uh, which has led to the efficient networking, uh, interconnectivity, and provide the communication protocol used by the, the differences of IoT device, such uh, using the IoT device, uh, this uh, can let the vital parameter fit into the system to produce the efficient production. So the core part of the industry 4.1 is mainly consists of the artificial intelligence and information technology. The next slide, please. So when we go into the details of the, uh, to have the better understanding on how AI is involving in the industry 4.0, in the cyber cyber uh, physical system, the figure the given figure show that the uh, the framework can be uh, divided into four phases. The first phase is the involving the closed loop of the IoT connectivity, networking, and communication protocol, which is used by the differences of IoT device, including sensor. So, uh, so. Uh, for the second phase is the big data analysis, building up on the awareness of the what is happening. Answering this question can help the organization understand the root cause of the uh, the root cause behind the critical incident. For example, big data analysis can help the organization to process those massive heterogeneous uh, data, create prediction model, and to analyze the data for further improve, improving the production process. For the simulation, performing simulation can also answer the question about the system state operation under the different condition. For example, uh, any signal uh, of the malfunction predict in the virtual system can, can be quickly spot in the timely manner. So uh, before the physical action uh, become the uh, malfunction. And the third phase is the autonomous operation in order to make the system with zero human intervention uh, therefore, artificial intelligence and machine learning need to be taken into consideration for improving reliability, accuracy, efficiency in the, product, in the production processes. Next slide. So uh, in short, by the definition of the artificial intelligence is the some kind of the view of the human side that aim to simulate the human intelligence like act to solve the problem to think rationally and to act like human so uh, by the way uh, we mostly observe that some people using the term of the artificial intelligence ai machine learning and deep learning synonymously however if we can see in the figure uh, deep learning is a subset of the machine learning and machine learning is a subset of uh, artificial intelligence ai next slide please so uh, from the 
with the promising benefit provided by the AI, we now a day we have seen that uh, AI had been increasingly and widely used in the various environments and many uh, application. So Sorry, for... I interrupt, Miss uh, Montida. That your time remain two minutes again, okay? Okay, sorry. Okay, uh, for example, we can use in the automated industry, social media, cybersecurity, architecture, robotic, and healthcare. Next slide. Uh, they also have pro and con for the arti applying the artificial intelligence. However, from the security perspective, uh, the interconnectivity between the cyber and the physical world of the cyber physical system can introduce new threat and challenge leading to the wider attack surface. For example, the attacker may uh, manipulate the um, AI model for the purpose of unlawful purpose. Next slide. So this slide will show, uh, you show you, we'll go discuss into the detail uh, to analyze its strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat. Next slide, please. For the first uh, strength about, about the leveraging AI, we can find using the AI to fly against the cyber crime. For example, in the law enforcement, we can use to improve the uh, crime prevention measure, or we can use for reinforcing investigation capability for physical threat detection. Next slide. For in terms of the vulnerability, in terms of the weakness, AI also uh, adversary can also exploit the vulnerability in the AI model to perform some illegal purpose. For example, using model attack to uh, to produce mal uh, fault prediction results. Next slide. Uh, for the second uh, is about the opportunity. Uh, we can leverage AI to, um, to build a smarter cybersecurity solution. As we can see in, the, in, in today, we can use the AI, we can apply AI for, to gain better biometric control or to help improve the cybersecurity prevention and detection in the, uh, in the network. Next slide. However- Sorry, Your time is- for, uh, just, over. Okay. Your time okay. is over. Okay, Maybe for, one minute again. Okay, one minute is okay. okay. For the misuse, okay, <laughs> we, the adversary may use the uh, use the AI for the evasion of the cyber security control. Or uh, next slide. In conclusion, okay. On the, on the one side, uh, AI can apply several, prom bring promising several benefit for the application uh, use. On the other side, uh, AI system can also be manipulated and mislead, resulting in the security implication. Therefore, secu security and realistically technique are vitally important when implementing the AI system. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Dr. Montida Pataranan Takul from Thailand for your interesting topic regarding the modern AI application and then cybersecurity, AI in manufacturing and also smarter cybersecurity in Thailand. Uh, please applause for Mr. Montida Pataranan Takul from Thailand. And then you can also prepare your question, comment, or anything else. We have uh, still two speakers for the last two speakers regarding the topic, the second topic in AI policies and also market trend in dialogue partners, countries for, from the Republic of Korea. I would like to invite Ms. Yesho Park, Deputy Director of MIST, Republic of Korea, for the AI policy division. Please, could you hear my son? Yes. Yeah, all right. The times and screen yours for next uh, 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Can you see this? Yeah, we can see, good. 
please. <coughs> Good morning. Uh, I'm the peer director of uh, I'm the peer director yes part of uh, AI policy division of MSIT. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to this uh, to give an overview of AI policy of Korea in this meeting. Currently, the world is faced with a uh, structural change. The sustainability of humanity is being certain due to countries. Uh, now, uh, due to countries uh, striving to gain dominance in advanced technology and overcoming global low growth, etc. Now, it is high time to seek new solutions by overcoming and leveraging the, the, this crisis as an opportunity to take a leap forward. Oh, we are presently living in the age of dig, digital revolution. Uh, digital technologies such as AI are fundamentally reshaping the economy and society as a whole. And AI itself, a new industry that creates in enormous added value. And AI is also a source that fundamentally changes industries and people's lives. In the future, there will be an era in which uh, competitiveness cannot be achieved without AI. To uh, lead this digital era, the government has ad established and promoted various strategies to secure competitiveness in AI uh, since 2016. Uh, recently, President Yoon underlined the need for a new digital order in September. Uh, for realizing universal values of humanity through digital technologies. Uh, the Korean government has established a national digital strategy to realize the New York, uh, New York initiative and stimulate digital innovation across <laughs> economy, society, <laughs> and government. In consideration of the present keynote and philosophy, the government is promoting policies in four aspects to lead the world with AI. I'll briefly explain them in turn. First of all, Korea is working on developing technologies for next generation AI. We support for fundamental research such as brain science to enhance fundamentals of AI and challenge R&D projects similar to DARPA grant challenge of the US have been actively carried out to come up with excellent AI ideas. Also, Korea is investing more than 1.5 trillion won for developing AI semiconductor. We plan to secure our own MPUF technology and uh, develop next generation MPU by 2029. Also, we are actively investigating in developing uh, PIM of high performance and high efficiency. In addition, uh, vouchers were provided to companies that they can freely develop and utilize AI. In process of uh, purchasing data, AI solutions, and cloud service, we, matching, uh, we match demand companies and suppliers and support the cost between them. Also, uh, secondly, Korea has established AI infrastructure. <coughs> Sorry. As data is a key resource of a key resource for AI, uh, Korea has made data publicly available and created a big data platforms in each field. In order to activate distribution of data, 
we are promoting systems such as quality certification and value evaluation in data field. Also, we are pushing for a full scale transition to the cloud through comprehensive support for SME, etc. Uh, and infrastructure is also being expanded, including construction of super supercomputer unit six. Sorry, I interrupt again. That your time remains two minutes for your talk. Okay. Oh, uh, Korea has been implementing AI convergence project to ena enable full scale deployment deployment of AI in over industries. Korea has taken the initiative uh, in carrying out AI convergence projects in diverse sectors. Uh, a case is in point is Dr. Answer, which is an AI-based medical solution that makes diagnosis of disease only takes a few minutes. Also, Korea will establish a digital platform government by, uh, by leveraging the cap capabilities of the public and private sectors. Lastly, we are also working on create a uh, safe and healthy environment to develop and utilize AI. In 2020, national AI ethics standards were established. And since then, tools for practicing AI ethics has been developed. We also, uh, the AI framework, framework act will be at, established that encourage the industry to innovate and guarantees the basic rights to all citizens in the zero era. Uh, this brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Yeshua Park from the Ministry of Science and ICT, Republic of Korea, regarding the topic of structural transformation in Korea for the security economy society and environment, as we can see from the high story civilization in Republic of Korea regarding the digital transformation. Please applause for Ms. Yeshua Park from Republic of Korea. And then we have the last uh, speakers from the dialogue partner from USA. I do like invite for Mr. Carpen James, James Carpen, sorry. Yep. <laughs> All right. Uh, Ms. Uh, Mr. James Carpen from the Regional Technology Officer of U.S. Consulates General in Sydney. The times and screen yours for the 10 minutes. Thank you. Great. Hello, everybody. I'm hoping that you can see me, hear me, and also see my slides. Um, uh, yes, very good. Wonderful. Please. A couple of quick uh, preparatory marks, and I will be as, as very assiduous in staying to 10 minutes, so please do let me when I'm close to my time. Um, so my name is James Serv, and I'm with the U.S. Department of State. I'm based down in Sydney, but I represent the Washington, D.C. Uh, Science and Technology Advisors Office out here in the region, working with ASEAN and the Pacific Islands on critical and emerging technology issues. Um, I did want to say thank you so much to the ASEAN Secretariat uh, for all of your hard work in pulling this together and all of our ASEAN colleagues as a dialogue partner. It's very exciting to be able to join. Um, I'd also like to say salamat siang again to all of my friends in Indonesia. I served in Jakarta for three years on cyber and ICT issues. And so it is wonderful to see colleagues from BRIN, um, from BSSN, and from other parts of the Indonesian government joining us today. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and then finally, a huge thank you to His Excellency, the Ambassador uh, from the ROK to ASEAN, and also our colleagues from MSIT who joined us today. Um, your briefing on the digital uh, strategy, which was just announced in the New York Initiative, which uh, President Yoon brought up uh, on the sideline of the UN General Assembly, is, is extremely helpful. Um, we were very happy uh, to lead a delegation to Seoul to participate in the first uh, digital ministerial conference um, led by the Republic of Korea uh, just about two weeks ago. And it was a really great experience where we saw many ASEAN uh, member states and, and others from SCAP, uh, the Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, um, learning about digital transformation and the future that, that Korea seeks to play as a leader on digital technology. So um, we're, as always, extremely happy to collaborate with our, our colleagues from Korea and also our colleagues from ASEAN 
on all issues related to ICT. So that leads me to my presentation today. Um, rather than try to cover the entirety of US AI policy or international engagement on policy, I wanted to focus on one particular area that might be beneficial, um, but sometimes overlooked by all of the different member states. And so that's related to privacy enhancing technologies and their relationship to artificial intelligence. Um, I am not a mathematician or a computer science uh, expert, so I will keep this at a very high level of generality, but I would like to at least raise the importance of pets or privacy enhancing technologies in the US strategy for improving AI implementation um, in a variety of fields, including cybersecurity, agriculture, energy, um, and other AI applications in health, et cetera. So we'll just quickly go through very quickly, what are privacy enhancing technologies? Um, so privacy enhancing technologies, are a very diverse group of tools um, consisting of both hardware and software, um, some that have been around since the 1970s, others that have just been developed in the last few years, um, that allow us to use sensitive data or access sensitive data without necessarily ever holding the data ourselves. We're able to take advantage of sensitive data, um, but we're not necessarily required to transfer it or have trust in somebody who we're giving that data to in order to access that data. So by keeping data hidden um, from other users while simultaneously enab enabling the analysis of that data, um, we allow ourselves to gain new insights from existing information and to share information between different entities, whether that's government offices, um, whether that's between different businesses, or even if that's between different countries, um, crossing borders and moving data from, say, uh, you know, one ASEAN member to another from the United States to Australia, where I'm located. Um, you know, data and privacy are really central uh, to the success that we hope to see from AI and other emerging technologies. Really, it's it's not negotiable. We can't make, decide that there's a trade-off between um, data privacy and data security and AI and sort of data development and data sharing. We need to find a way for data sharing and privacy and AI to all coexist in order to really see the maximum benefit of this technology. So that's why the White House and the Office of Science Technology Policy has created a fast track committee um, that is developing right now a strategy for privacy enhancing technologies with an eye towards making sure that pets are used for AI and, and help enable an AI uh, future in the United States and around the world. So why privacy enhancing technologies? I've touched on this a little bit. But one of the central con conundrums or, or difficulties that we run into in managing AI platforms is that we need to have people trust uh, whoever is collecting the data enough to share their data, to allow their data to be made available to them. So privacy enhances trust uh, by providing and helping people understand um, what a privacy enhancing technology can do and how they're implemented in a given application, um, we're able to convince individuals and businesses that they can trust the, the, the confidentiality of digital technologies like AI. And so by improving that trust, we increase the amount of data that can be shared and who it can be shared to. Um, and that allows us to increase data flows. And one critical piece of US policy when it comes to the internet and artificial intelligence is ensuring that we have as much as possible free data flows with trust um, to allow people to share information between individuals, businesses, and nations. So building on privacy to obtain trust and building from trust mm -hmm. to obtain data flows, we're moving on to an open and free internet. And so this is a, a core tenet of US government policy is that the free flow of data um, supports open, free, interoperable, and secure internet, um, including artificial intelligence that we think is vital to a modern society. So in a very simple, simple nutshell, that is why we believe the pets are important and why we think they have to be part of a strategy um, for artificial intelligence. So moving on, how do they relate? Well, we'll tack this from another angle. Um, when you think about artificial intelligence, one simple way to think about artificial intelligence capabilities is to think of a triangle. There's really three categories of issues that we think are really important. One is computing power. In order to run a large neural network, in order to develop a really strong AI algorithm, um, you do have to have high performance computing. Um, you also have to have computers and computer scientists who are able to develop algorithms um, that can be developed in neural networks that can be developed to answer um, some of the very difficult questions that we're describing in many, many of the different presentations today, whether it's identifying a prawn underwater um, or looking for uh, anomalies inside of a network to identify cybercrime. Um, you need these algorithms in order to be able to analyze large amounts of data using these computers. But really critical to this is available data. The, the availability of data that is um, trustworthy and secure 
really defines what can be uh, done with our algorithms and with our computing power. With a small collection of data in small um, diverse locations, maybe individual businesses or individual owners, um, there's only so much data that you can operate an AI algorithm or, or a computer on. But if you're able to collect that data in one place, you're able to maximize the size of the data stores that are available. You're allowing those AI algorithms and computing power um, that's running the AI to really achieve its maximum, uh, its maximum abilities and its maximum performance. So for us, we think that maximizing the availability of data, allowing people to share data is really critical to making sure that we have a robust and, and vibrant AI um, environment. And, and certainly in ASEAN, where you have so many different startups, so many large companies all collecting data, so many different governments at the national and subnational level, the ability to share data between all of these different entities will really increase everyone's ability to maximize their own AI potential. And so that's really what we want to focus on when we're looking at privacy enhancing technologies. So just to underscore this one more time, oftentimes you'll hear that there's a discussion, well, we can share data or we can have data privacy, but we can't necessarily have both. And so oftentimes it'll be seen as this tension where we have trade-offs between data sharing and privacy and trust. We actually don't think that that's necessarily the case. I think by embracing privacy enhancing technologies, technologies that allow you to share information or access information um, without necessarily revealing private or information about individual citizens or um, revealing everything about a particular data set, you're able to maximize um, the overall value of the data that you have. So instead of looking at it as a conflict, data sharing and data privacy, if you apply privacy enhancing technologies can actually work together. Um, one graph that I like to show comes from the Royal Society, which back in 2019 um, provided this graph and did a really great analysis of a variety of different privacy enhancing technologies. And really what they were saying is, if you look at this blue line over here, right now that is a trade-off between the utility of data and the privacy. And as you increase privacy, the trade-off is you lose utility. Um, and as you increase utility, you lose privacy. With research and development into privacy enhancing technologies, you're able to access this orange line. You're able to, in fact, increase the utility of data while increasing the privacy of the data. And so that's really the goal that we're trying to achieve here through privacy enhancing technologies. So quickly, I'd like to give some examples of pets. There are literally dozens of different types. Um, they can be broken down into a variety of cryptographic techniques. Um, they can also be related to obfuscation um, or sharing of data through uh, trusted intermediaries. And they can also be broken down into hardware. Um, some of these include multi-party computation. Um, that's where, it, we'll go into an example of that, but uh, it's a place where um, individual parties are able to share small pieces of information with each other and access maybe a trusted data bank or um, operate different AI algorithms on a particular data set without revealing the entirety of their data set. Homomorphic encryption is another example where you're able to um, retain the structure of data while changing the individual data points in order to make sure that you aren't revealing um, information about a particular person, but you are at the same time um, maintaining the fidelity and structure of the data to allow you to experiment with AI applications. Um, there's also obfuscation, federated learning, synthetic data, creating data, um, that reflects real data sets, but doesn't necessarily um, reveal a particular accurate uh, representation of a particular person. Um, in addition to that, there's things called zero knowledge proofs. There's also private set intersections. There's differential privacy. There's anonymization. And the list goes on and on and on. And so I won't go into all of those because we only have about 10 minutes. Um, but I did want to provide just a couple of quick examples from what we've seen in the US on, on what we would do for applications of some of these PETs. So one of these is in public health and you've already sorry, seen some I, of these sorry. discussions. I go ahead. interrupt again, that's your time uh, remains uh, three minutes again. Perfect, so th in three minutes, I'll just quickly touch on public health. We've already had a couple of great presentations on using AI, for example, to identify uh, cases of pneumatic illness, looking at different lung pictures, sharing health data is extremely important. It can also be useful for identifying trends in um, COVID cases. Um, but it is also an extremely sensitive type of information. Different hospitals are reluctant to share information about their individual patients, um, including when they might have COVID um, or what the symptoms of that COVID might be. And so creating a way for different individual hospitals or medical regulators to share information about cases um, using, for example, um, a central server um, in a federated learning model um, would allow us to aggregate data and by having that data in one location, um, we allow each of these individual hospitals to work off of a individual AI model, um, referring back to an aggregated data set um, without ever accessing that data in order to learn whether or not their model, when looked at from a very large data set, 
is uh, in fact representative and effective at predicting different types of COVID disease or other types of disease. And so we found that to be a very successful way of guarding against COVID um, and other types of diseases is to work between, for example, the United States and Japan um, on sharing data sets or sharing access to data without gaining direct visibility into that data in order for us to calibrate our AI models for long COVID and predicting who and who will not have long COVID in a given clinical situation. Another example, and I'll go through this very, very quickly, is financial crimes. Um, it's very rare that banks are willing to share information about their customers. It's highly regulated data. It's also confidential information that relates to their competitiveness. And a lot of different competitors might not want to share information because they're worried that it would damage um, their ability to compete against other banks. However, if you create using privacy enhancing technologies, it's possible um, to use secure multi-party computation, uh, which is a form of privacy enhancing technology to allow banks to share pieces of information with each other um, in a way that allows them all to conduct analysis to look for trends or anomalies in particular types of transactions. They might be able to catch somebody who's conducting fraud against multiple institutions at the same time using a larger data set without necessarily looking at the individual data information about a particular person or looking at each other's client lists. And so this can be a very helpful tool for financial crime as well. There's a bunch of challenges related to adopting pets. I'm happy to go into these in the questions, but they're extremely diverse. They do have, there's limited technical expertise out there in understanding how they work. People who are going to consume pets don't necessarily understand them. Also, regulators don't necessarily understand how they plug into um, a given privacy regime. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. From the U.S. perspective, we're absolutely looking to promote training. Um, we're looking to advance governance and standards to make sure that people understand what is and is not a, an appropriate use of privacy enhancing technology. Um, we're also looking to accelerate transition to practice and to promote fundamental research. I'll very sorry. quickly go into examples sorry, uh, of international cooperation. Sorry to interrupt again. Your time, oh. one, one minute maybe. One minute is perfect. Perfect. That sorry. will be exactly what I need. So yeah, with one minute, one minute okay. I wanted to give one example maybe of, of, of what some of the United States international initiatives have been in privacy enhancing technologies. So this would include bilateral cooperation. Um, we have a number of state federal agencies that work with um, Japan, the UK, Germany, India, and others um, to share information about privacy enhancing technologies um, and to develop them together. Um, one great example of this is that the US and the UK just launched a challenge prize. Um, so it's a prize pool of about 1.6 million US dollars. Um, that's been av made available to businesses that can come up with new ideas on how to use pets to address crime and pandemic response. And those two examples I just provided. So we're looking forward this year to uh, naming a few winners of those tri of, of those challenges. Multilaterally, we're also very interested in working. In addition to working with our ASEAN partners, um, the UN Committee uh, on Experts on Big Data and Data Science for Official Statistics has been very active in developing a pilot program um, to share statistical information among national offices. And then of course, the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence, which uh, is a, related to the OECD and their monitoring program for AI, um, has 19 different members. Um, one of those is Singapore, the United States and Korea are also members working on a PETS project um, to pilot real world deployment of these privacy enhancing technologies to maximize AI development. So watch this space and I'm happy to go into more detail about that in the questions if desired. So thank you very much for your time and I, I do appreciate uh, the opportunity to present. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. James from, Mr. Carpen James from Regional Technology Officer of USA regarding the philosophy of pets, privacy enhancing, enhancing technology for AI as we can use as the sensitive data for hardware and also software at US. All right, thank you very much for your talk. Give a uh, Please uh, applause for Mr. James Kerpen. And then now is the time for question and answer. So you have uh, 15 minutes as we divide for two sessions. We have uh, the first session is uh, three question or comment or anything else, please. And to which speaker you ask and uh, comment. Would you help me to give a mic to the from the online or offline audience, please? And introduce your, your name. Hi, my name is uh, Muhammad Hafiz Gifari. I'm from uh, Badan Meteorologi, Klimatologi, dan Geofisika atau uh, Meteorological, Climatological, and Geophysical Agency of Indonesia. And uh, my my question, can I ask two questions? Yeah, really? please. Yeah. To who? Uh, the first one is to Dr. Lim Tianghu from Brunei. Um, well, 
um, I studied oceanography and I, I do also study underwater imaging while pursuing my master's degree at URI, University of Rhode Island. Uh, and it's the smallest and American state of the US. Anyway, uh, one of our school grade was Robert Ballard and we, we found the Titanic. The question is how it's very hard to implement AI image recognition at the ocean without a lot of manual interception, meaning that the automation automatication is very, very limited. At work, we also apply um, on tsunami potential of an earthquake. And from our experience, simply use, using AI, especially in underwater imaging on, on, or somewhat like that, is al always very possible, especially in our initial information for an earthquake. In conclusion, nature is un unpredictable. Manual expertise is always needed for AI. Could you? And my question, question so, yeah. is, uh, this is the background of my question, sorry. Uh, I'm very interested to, uh, to ask uh, if you can please elaborate a bit on how you apply the AI, AI on the underwater particles that you showed. I forgot what particle it was, but it was, I'm sure it was related to fisheries. I know it's a small scale and in a small scale and controlled environment, but still I'm very curious. Thank you. And the first one is the second one maybe to uh, Mr. Uh, Sir, Sir, sorry, what's the name? Uh, From which country? Which country? Uh, in the United States. Uh, United Surfen, States. Surfen. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Surfen, I I don't really know what uh, what kind of uh, example that you were talking about. Maybe it's uh, uh, it's in banking, it's in crime uh, tracking. The but the question is, uh, what can we see in our our everyday life about the PTE PETs? Uh, I'm sure it's maybe about uh, about the vanish mode in Instagram or in Telegram, maybe vanish mode. So we write something and then it disappears. Uh, All right, thank you yeah. for your question. Thank you. So directly answer is better for you. The first for the representative uh, Brunei Darussalam, Dr. Lim Tiong Ho, please answer okay. your the question. And the second okay. to yeah to Mr. James from USA. All right, please, your time from Lim Tiong Ho. Okay, thank you. So it was interesting questions. I mean, based on what you're trying to do, you're trying to observe tsunami using AI. So I think for what I've shown on my slides is actually it's a particles, but I'm not supposed to do AI on the particles, but I'm supposed to detect the prawn inside the particles, maybe within the particle itself. So what we can usually do, let's say, let's, let, let, let me address your questions more than what I've shown on my, on my slides, because I think you're more interested in how I can, I mean, how you can actually apply AI for your yes, underwater please. oceans. Yeah. So, so I think one of the things that you need to do is, I mean, tsun tsunamis in underwater, you need to predict it in, 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 before it actually happens, isn't it? I think that's the main purpose is why you want to use AI. So one of the things that you can do, most probably you can have some underwater cameras. I mean, especially during a quake, right? I mean, if you, if you can deploy your cameras during the earthquake itself, underwater earthquake, and try to capture the images, what happened during the earthquake, sort of the AI can actually help you to understand whether what are the chances that particular earthquake can actually cause tsunami. Because tsunami is usually caused by how, how strong that particular earthquake is and how the 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 characteristics of the, I call it the structures of the floor, the bed sea bed. So you can use those images and try to capture it and, and use the predictions on how much uh, 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 the, the, the earthquake has actually causes the, the breakage of the under 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 sea bed. However, I mean for your cases for under under for the for the oceans, I think it's much more easier because oceans usually have a better better visibility compared to what I have in a farm. So, so, so on, top, on top of using the cameras, you can also use other sense, sensing devices to actually to predict the, the vibrations of the, of the underwater. And then you can actually use AI to actually to match those multi-dimensional data to actually to predict the chances of the occurrence of the tsunami. However, one of the things that you need to be, before you can able to do AI, you need to have the data to train your AI model. So that is the main thing that you need to think of how you can collect those data first, which I think is very limited availability as well. Right. right. Thank because you very think... much, uh, Dr. Lin yeah, uh, Tiongho, for your answer. And then the next uh, answer, 
uh, please, uh, Mr. Thank James Kelvin. Thank you. I mean, go Rhode Island. Um, thank you for the question about, about pets. So from a practical perspective, um, you see them all the time. Um, have you ever used your, if you've ever used your thumb uh, to open up your phone, uh, like a lot of people do, um, there's actually something called a, a trusted uh, encryption environment inside of most phones, which is a piece of hardware, um, a, 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 a piece of the processor that, that maintains that information separate from other information. It's a privacy enhancing technology that is designed to prevent um, information about you know key biometrics like your your thumbprint or your face uh, facial ID from being shared with the rest of the information on your phone freely. Um, so that's just one example of a hardware pet. I'd say from a data sharing perspective and an AI perspective, um, in any application where you stand to benefit from a stronger AI analysis of um, data that could be seen as sensitive, particularly health health data. So if you go in to have a test done uh, radiologically to identify perhaps a tumor in your lungs or another disease, um, the ability of privacy enhancing technology to allow um, hospitals to share larger data sets and then run better algorithms off of those data sets can directly help you um, by improving the diagnosis uh, and your potential for recovery or early diagnosis in some of these diseases. So those are a couple of examples. All right, thank you very much okay. for your answer. And then, because the limited time, we have uh, five minutes or seven minutes again. Please, uh, the one from offline audience, uh, Mr. Ritki, please, a brief uh, question, short yeah. question to which uh, speakers you want. I have two questions. First, for you, Sul Park from uh, Korea, MIT. Could you share about the Korea uh, experiment experience on the sharing the AI infrastructures, especially for a big number of users. The second one is for Mr. James Coffern from United States about PAT. Uh, at your slide, I read uh, that we can use the data without access uh, the data itself. But how about the ethical issue, especially uh, when we access the medical record of the person? Uh, I think it should be a kind of informed consent uh, for the, that the owners of the data that we access. Uh, what is your comment about this? Uh, thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Ritke. And then uh, I invite uh, Ms. Uh, Yeshua Park to comment or answer uh, the question from Mr. Ritke regarding the AI. Oh, what what num what number of page? Which page? Uh, which page do you What's mean? What topic? Uh, on, on the topic of the AI infrastructures that in, at, at Georgia, at, at, I forgot the name of the city that you have the GPU. GPU about machines. data? Yes, no, about the infrastructures. Infrastructure. AI infrastructures. This one, this one, yeah. Uh, Pick, uh, this one. This one? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, Oh, we we made a plan to make a digital platform government. Oh, which means we can oh, we connect government systems. Oh, like um Ministry of Science and ICT or Ministry of Agriculture. or oh, and so on and. We oh, we remove regu oh on this page hmm. we promote a uh, digitalization of public administration and also we uh, make a uh, informa uh, made an environment that we can use many uh, information freely and safely. Oh, actually, it is. Oh, if you need more information, I can give you more information on email. Thank you. 
yeah. maybe you can how about the answer mr ritke <laughs> yes okay maybe we can pursue by email contact thank you very much uh miss yesel fox and then the second question to <laughs> mr james carpen please again um thank you again for the question and and so as i understood it it was you know if you're sharing information um, for AI applications, is there an ethical concern that people who own that data, for example, a person who owns the record about, say, their lungs uh, being transferred to another person would be um, a concern? Would you need their permission? Would you need a privacy regulation to address that? Um, so that's that's the beauty of, of, of privacy enhancing technologies. If done right, you're not actually transferring the information about that person, say James Servan's lungs, we're not necessarily transferring information that identifies me or my, you know, the picture of my, um, you know, health records. We might be using either encryption or we might be um, transforming it by adding a little bit of noise or pulling out names and then adding in a little bit more uh, information that that we can then reverse when we do the analysis back at home, but we're, we're changing the data enough or we're adding enough encryption to it that you're not really sharing information about a particular person when that information goes um, to a different place for analysis. And so you're allowing that either added noise, added encryption, um, or you know partial sharing of data um, or transformation of data um, to eliminate the risk that a person is going to be identified um, but at the same time, still accessing the useful pieces of that information um, so that you're able to make new and interesting uh, discoveries using artificial intelligence. So it's it's really a way of changing the data so you don't have to worry as much about the ethical considerations or the regulatory considerations. That said, um, it's it won't fix everything. And so what what I think the U.S. government would say is that it's important to understand the possibilities of what pets can do. Um, and to allow those to make it easier to share data inside of a regulatory environment um, that is being developed by, say, ASEAN or through APEC or others. And so it's it's certainly not a solution for all privacy concerns, um, but it's a way to reduce some of the privacy in a particular set of data in order to maximize your ability to share it um, without violating any of those regulatory or ethical concerns. I hope that makes sense. And um, I'd recommend taking a look at that Royal Society paper um, that I cited um, on my slides. If you want to learn more about this, I think it's a really helpful guide. Um, and there's others coming out as well. I'm happy to share. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much for your answer. And then I, this is uh, the limited time for the last minute. Maybe I keep uh, the last uh, question from the online audience. Maybe if you have question from the online, only one. Any question from the online? Please speak out, maybe directly. Any question, answer, or uh, sorry, question or comment, maybe. But if you know question from the online audience, maybe from one question from the offline, uh, please and introduce your name and brief or short question, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, my name is Yudi Aditya Warman. Uh, I'm from uh, Research Center of Electronics. I'll, I'd like to have a question for Mr. James Servant. <clears throat> um, um, when you say that uh, you're working on one of the work is about uh, uh, privacy dat of data, right? <clears throat> uh, this is very interesting because one of the problem is that how, how can we use the data without uh, compromising the informations of individual informations? That's the, uh, because that's the issue that uh, you're trying to solve it by using this privacy. But there's another, another problem. <clears throat> the other problem is that uh, the, uh, the confidence of the result of the, the analysis of, uh, the analysis of uh, artificial intelligence for example, when we use um, this data for health information, for example, then the, uh, the artificial intelligence predicts something, right? Uh, sometimes the doctor has some hesitance in um, accepting the result of the, uh, the, the result of this, uh, the result of the, uh, 
uh, artificial intelligence, right? Please, um, uh, a short question. Yes, my question is, um, uh, how do you solve this acceptance problem? Because uh, the user usually consider uh, artificial intelligence as a black box, right? Uh, is there any solutions to make the acceptance of artificial intelligence bigger for, uh, for people who are not programmers or mathematicians? Thank you very much. I, thank you for that question. And it, it's something I bet all of these distinguished experts on this panel um, would have something to say about explainability and, and trust in AI systems because these neural nets are so complicated and, and they are looking at especially large data sets and, and seeing things that ordinary humans do not. So it, it's a struggle whether you're using pets or you're just using AI and big data. Um, pets add an extra level of concern because people don't always understand how the privacy was also maintained while the data was shared. Um, I think that it's important to engage with multiple stakeholders. Partly it's public education and making sure the data um, analysis and, and tools is part of education for um, you know, many industries that have resisted it, whether it's medicine or law or others. It's probably important to understand the basics and rudiments of AI now um, in any professional industry, um, even those that don't necessarily have a strong um, data component traditionally. I think on top of that, working with multiple stakeholders. So um, doctors, for example, I was talking to somebody here in Australia yesterday. They have a new AI program for detecting whether or not um, spinal surgeries would be successful based on large data analysis. Um, and doctors do have questions about whether or not, you know, should an AI be making recommendations? Should they be referring AI information? Why can't they just make the decision themselves? Um, so this company ended up talking to American insurers, which are very interested in learning about whether or not there's another way to get a second opinion on some of these very expensive uh, um, uh, surgeries. And so partly it's, it's looking for different groups that might be interested in finding new ways to validate information that, that want to double check um, sort of traditional expertise and, and working with them also um, to see if you can't find allies who can then introduce AI technologies. And gradually, I think doctors become more comfortable with it as it reduces their workload um, and simplifies some of their easier cases, allows them to focus on the harder cases. Um, but it does take time. And I think you do have to look at different stakeholders and you do have to educate um, from a very early beginning. Sorry for the long answer. And, and thanks for the opportunity to, to speak on that. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. James, for your answer. And this is uh, our time is over. So our session for the first plenary session regarding the topic knowledge sharing by ASEAN member states and also the policy, AI policy and market trend from the dialogue partner uh, from Republic of Korea and also from Yese was finished. So we have uh, the next session, but before we go to the next session, uh, please applause for our uh, session today. And then to the next uh, session, I would like to invite the, I would like to turn back to the uh, MC, Ms. Dara. Thank you very much for your help. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Rismunandar for leading the session and um, as well as the productive discussion of our uh, plenary session today. And however, before we move to the next session, which is a panel discussion, cooperation between Republic of Korea and US for ASEAN's digital transformation, we're going to have a, an hour break. And it is started at 12, Five, and we'll turning back to the room again at 1 5 p.m. And however, again, beforehand, um, our colleague from Korea has given us a souvenir that you may access at the registration table in front of this room. So uh, they, uh, they've given us the skincare from Korea. So. Maybe for girl, you might like this one. Okay, sure. Um, well, thank you very much uh, for for the full discussion, and we'll see you in an hour. Thank you.
as Yen Wei is caring. As Yen Wei is sharing. No matter the distance between us, ASEAN still unites as tight to keep us fight as one no harm can defeat us no pain can frighten us since we are always one harmony is what we believe in no one will be left behind so we can fly as one blow our love to the sky since we are always one
ASEAN WAY IS CARING ASEAN WAY IS SHARING NO MATTER THE DISTANCE BETWEEN US ASEAN STILL UNITES Hearts tight to keep us fight as one. No harm can defeat us, no pain can frighten us, since we are always one. Harmony is what we believe in, no one will be left behind. So we can fly as one, blow our love to the sky, since we are always one.
ASEAN WAY IS CARING ASEAN WAY IS SHARING NO MATTER THE DISTANCE BETWEEN US ASEAN STILL UNITES AS Hearts tight to keep us fight as one. No harm can defeat us, no pain can frighten us, since we are always one. Harmony is what we believe in, no one will be left behind. So we can fly as one, blow our love to the sky, since we are always one. Let's
as Yen Wei is caring, as Yen Wei is sharing, no matter the distance between us, ASEAN still unites us. Hearts tight to keep us fight as one. No harm can defeat us, no pain can frighten us, since we are always one. Harmony is what we believe in, no one will be left behind. So we can fly as one, blow our love to the sky, since we are always one.
ASEAN WAY IS CARING ASEAN WAY IS SHARING NO MATTER THE DISTANCE BETWEEN US ASEAN STILL UNITES Hearts tight to keep us fight as one. No harm can defeat us, no pain can frighten us, since we are always one. Harmony is what we believe in, no one will be left behind. So we can fly as one, blow our love to the sky, since we are always one.
ASEAN WAY IS CARING ASEAN WAY IS SHARING NO MATTER THE DISTANCE BETWEEN US ASEAN STILL UNITES AS hearts tight to keep us fight as one no harm can defeat us no pain can frighten us since we are always one harmony is what we believe in no one will be left behind so we can fly as one blow our love to the sky since we are always one
ASEAN WAY IS CARING ASEAN WAY IS SHARING NO MATTER THE DISTANCE BETWEEN US ASEAN STILL UNITES Hearts tight to keep us fight as one. No harm can defeat us, no pain can frighten us, since we are always one. Harmony is what we believe in, no one will be left behind. So we can fly as one, blow our love to the sky, since we are always one.
as Yen Wei is caring, as Yen Wei is sharing, no matter the distance between us, ASEAN still unites as Hearts tight to keep us fight as one. No harm can defeat us, no pain can frighten us, since we are always one. Harmony is what we believe in, no one will be left behind. So we can fly as one, blow our love to the sky, since we are always one.
ASEAN WAY IS CARING ASEAN WAY IS SHARING NO MATTER THE DISTANCE BETWEEN US ASEAN STILL UNITES AS Hearts tight to keep us fight as one. No harm can defeat us, no pain can frighten us, since we are always one. Harmony is what we believe in, no one will be left behind. So we can fly as one, blow our love to the sky, since we are always one. Let's
ASEAN WAY IS CARING ASEAN WAY IS SHARING NO MATTER THE DISTANCE BETWEEN US ASEAN STILL UNITES AS hearts tight to keep us fight as one no harm can defeat us no pain can frighten us since we are always one harmony is what we believe in no one will be left behind so we can fly as one blow our love to the sky since we are always one
ASEAN WAY IS CARING ASEAN WAY IS SHARING NO MATTER THE DISTANCE BETWEEN US ASEAN STILL UNITES hearts tight to keep us fight as one no harm can defeat us no pain can frighten us since we are always one harmony is what we believe in no one will be left behind so we can fly as one blow our love to the sky since we are always one
ASEAN WAY IS CARING ASEAN WAY IS SHARING NO MATTER THE DISTANCE BETWEEN US ASEAN STILL UNITES AS Hearts tight to keep us fight as one. No harm can defeat us, no pain can frighten us, since we are always one. Harmony is what we believe in, no one will be left behind. So we can fly as one, blow our love to the sky, since we are always one.
Ito ay fictional character. Ito ba ay, uh, ito ba ay animal? So, something like that. Right, good afternoon, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, all participants both in person and virtually. Thank you for staying um, to our agenda today. And we are moving on to the next agenda, which is panel discussion. And we're about to start the panel discussion, uh, which will be led by Dr. Ji Yoon Kim from the Science and Technology Policy Institute of Republic of Korea. Okay, I repeat. We're going to start a panel discussion, which will be led by Dr. Ji Yoon Kim from the Science and Technology Policy Institute of the Republic of Korea. So Hello. I will hand it over. Uh, maybe I will greet first, Dr. Jihyun Kim. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Can so you hear me clearly? Without, yeah, we can hear you clearly. So without any further ado, I will turn this over to, to you, Mr. Jihyun. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, thank you for joining our panel discussion under the theme of um, cooperation between ROK and US for ASEAN's digital transformation. Uh, my name is Jihan Kim, uh, working at Science and Technology Policy, Policy Institute in Korea. I'm really uh, glad and honored to uh, moderate this uh, panel discussion with uh, distinguished uh, panelists. Um, we have uh, four panelists today. Uh, we have um, Professor and Dr. Uh, Masudi Wahyu uh, Ki Ki Woro, uh, Board of Governors of the National Agency for uh, Research and Innovation of the Republic of Indonesia. And we have uh, Professor Chok Yu from Korea University. Uh, and we have uh, James Servan uh, from Regional Technology Officer uh, of U.S. Consulate, uh, Consulate General in Sydney. And we have uh, my friend, Dr. Jurina Mokta, uh, Head of I I Science and Technology Division, um, ASEAN Secretariat. Um, hello, everyone. Hello. hello. Good afternoon from Jakarta. Hello. Hello. Um, yeah, um, some of you, I cannot see you the face of, oh, okay. Okay, um, do, do we have uh, Professor Yu here? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, let me let me throw the uh, first questions that uh, the organizers want me to do. <laughs> uh, first, first discussion question will be uh, going to um, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Kisuru and uh, Dr. Mokta. What stage is ASEAN's uh, digital transformation using uh, artific artificial intelligence and what is demand for cooperation uh, with advanced countries such as ROK and US? 
So we'll start first. Mm-hmm. Dr. Zurina or me? You first. Okay. <laughs> Not lady first. <laughs> okay, uh, Dr. G and everyone, good afternoon. Uh, it, I'm glad to be here. So to answer the uh, question, uh, can I show one slide? Yes, yes, please. Okay. Let me share my slide. First, uh, if we talk about enterprise digital transformation, transformation, actually, until now, we don't, at least in Indonesia, we don't have a, a standard framework. So I developed a framework that uh, I implemented in several uh, uh, corporations in Indonesia. This is the model of the framework. Uh, Basically, the, the, the foundation, one of the foundation is AI. And we have uh, six pillars there. Uh, so this is the, 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 the pictorial view of uh, my enterprise digital uh, transformation framework. So from this framework, we see here that artificial intelligence is one of the uh, important foundation of the, the, the framework itself. And uh, when we implement uh, AI and digital transformation, then we have to uh, part. The first part is in, in automation part. The second, we just start from uh, standardization, simplification, and then automation. The second part is on analytic part. The, these two parts are going together in parallel uh, to be implemented in uh, digital transformation to increase productivity, profits, and enhance experience. For example, if uh, we, okay, back there, put those two parts needs data that uh, we will uh, talk today is the cooperation where whether we can share the, the data uh, because yeah. whether the uh, either part that we choose will basically needs data to be used. For automation part, uh, we, we start from uh, a simple macro and script and then uh, move to uh, upward to business process automation and then to robotic process automation. The robotic process automation is currently is very popular in Indonesia. Several uh, corporations, several big corporations and also some government offices already implementing uh, robotic process automation. And then in the next, maybe we will implement intelligent process automation and um, algorithmic business. This is from automation part. From the uh, analytic part, we can also move uh, from the lowest one, which is uh, descriptive, the only uh, display what happened. This is basically the data analytic or something like that. And then uh, uh, up, upward, we can move upward to diagnostic, which is uh, telling us what happened, why it happened. And then uh, the third uh, stage is on predictive stages uh, which uh, explain or predict future and then the fourth level is on prescriptive which is re recommending the the right or, or, or optimal action and decision and the uh, highest uh, one is the cognitive business so uh, this is uh, re relating adapting to change so this is basically the <clears throat> why ai is a uh, important in digital transformation and uh, because ASEAN countries are having quite similar uh, a lot of similar things then cooperation in using data in both uh, in, in uh, among the country will be important for us thank you thank Dr. you G. thank you thank you Dr. Kizoro uh, thank you for sharing us the Indonesian uh, uh, strategy and strategy framework and um, can you add up, uh, Dr. Bongta? Yes, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kim. Thank you for the question. Good to see you again, although still virtually. Thank you, organizer, for having me in this workshop. I'm um, great to meet um, fellow panelists, Professor Marsudi, Prof. Yu, Dr. Uh, Servan, virtual in the session. So I think um, essentially there are two parts of the question. Uh, the first one is the stage of ASEAN digital transformation, and the second one is a demand for cooperation with advanced countries like uh, Korea and the US. So first off, in terms of um, ASEAN digital transformation, I would say that it can be um, safely argued that 
as a region, we are not fully digitized yet. But if you look into um, country level digital competitiveness ranking last year, one of the ASEAN member states, Singapore, is ranked at number five after US, Hong Kong, Sweden, and Denmark. As far as I'm concerned, Singapore is the only um, ASEAN member states being a member in the GPE, uh, the Global AR Partnership. Uh, for countries like um, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, we are at the top 60 rank, which uh, to me is not bad at all because um, it can be commended uh, considering that the majority of ASEAN member states are still developing countries. All 10 ASEAN member states, despite um, having different stages of economic development, all are committed to advance to PoIR through the implementation of our consolidated strategy on PoIR and at the same time uh, explore uh, the possibility of establishing new mechanisms and open platforms to support the government, uh, academia and industry in accelerating ASEAN transformation, which includes leveraging on AI technologies and its application. If we look at the bright side from the ASEAN uh, regional standpoint, we actually have a um, huge potential, very big potential to continue transforming digitally. And this was actually, um, I would say forcibly accelerated by the uh, pandemic and now changing the whole global value chain. Uh, the pandemic actually accelerated the pace of our digital transformation. Um, we saw exponential increase of um, 100 million internet users in ASEAN for the past three years and over 90 percent of e-commerce adoption uh, during the pandemic. So looking at the potential to move up the um, digital transformation ladder, uh, one of the biggest advantages is the fact that we have the fastest growing internet market in the world. We have about uh, 125,000 new users coming onto the internet every day in ASEAN. And the ASEAN digital um, economy is um, further projected to grow significantly, adding an estimated of uh, 1 trillion USD to the regional uh, GDP. So I think um, in this uh, discussion, uh, the more important question to me now is how um, ASEAN planning to transform digitally by unlocking its fullest potential, while at the same time um, addressing the existing digital divide, uh, the increase of cyber threats, uh, the rising of unemployment, and the widening of an um, inequality gap. So at this uh, present moment, ASEAN's effort to transform digitally by unlocking its fullest potential, while at the same time uh, try to address the challenges that I mentioned, is guided and supported by our key policies and strategies. The one is the um, ACRF, ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework. Second is the BSBR, um, Bandar Sri Begawan Roadmap. And number three would be the um, FYR uh, strategy, consolidated strategy. Number four, AEC Blueprint 2025. And number five, our master plan on ASEAN connectivity uh, 2025. Even this morning, we heard from our Deputy Secretary General on another newest initiative, uh, the scoping of ASEAN Digital uh, Economy Framework Agreement, DEFA. So at the regional level, this would be our guiding principle to transform digitally. I'm so sorry for the um, long answer, uh, but quickly to the second part of the question, on the demand for cooperation with the US and Korea? My answer is absolutely yes. The demand is always there, be it uh, bilaterally or multilaterally, uh, region to region or country to country cooperation. Uh, the US have been, has been ASEAN's uh, key partner for 45 years and Korea for 33 years and counting. So under the economic pillar, ASEAN, we are always on the lookout for uh, opportunities uh, to forge cooperation with mutual benefits collectively with all our partners, including US and Korea. Now that we are zooming into um, AI technology and application, uh, our workshop today is already, um, I would say, a clear manifestation of a demand for cooperation with the US and Korea being materialized. We know that um, at the bilateral level, country to country cooperation, um, some ASEAN member states already collaborate uh, with the US and Korea. We at ASEAN, we want to elevate uh, those cooperation to benefit the region as a whole. So I think um, in closing, uh, beyond capacity building, um, dialogue, uh, workshops and training programs, our focus um, in uh, the near future is also to harness uh, more AI tech transfer initiatives that would result in providing tangible solutions um, to the challenges faced by ASEAN member states on the ground, which can be addressed through AI technologies and application. So I think I stop there for now. Thank you. 
Uh, we have one more guest, uh, one more panelist. Um, I I missed you uh, at the first. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Thang Nguyen uh, from Committee of uh, Microelectronics and IT Chair uh, from Vietnam. Dr. Nguyen? Ah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Can you add up? Um, yeah. On the uh, so, yeah, I just follow the two uh, previous uh, comments uh, in from uh, Indonesia, one Spring and one from the ASEC, uh, Dr. Mokta. And I'm on behalf of the SCMIT, uh, this is in charge of the microelectronics and uh, information technology sector of uh, Coastal. That is the, uh, the committee for uh, science technology and innovation of as a whole uh, region. And yeah, uh, most of our committee are from the uh, institution, research institution and university. So we are more uh, biased to the technology instead of the policy. So the, uh, like I said, as uh, you just mentioned, it's about the policy, the strategy and uh, policy maker in, in Asia, in the region. But for from uh, our point of view that, uh, yeah, my, my comment also in the two parts. The first is about the, uh, the current status of digital transformation of the ASEAN, the whole reason, uh, in terms of technology first, more focused on technology. And the second part is how we can collaborate with, uh, with uh, uh, Korea and the US in terms of the technology in digital transformation. So for the first part, I think, yeah, the technology, yeah, digital transformation is the, now is a kind of very popular terms for the government and the society in the in, in the global scale, not only for the ASEAN 10 member states. But I think uh, at, in, in ASEAN, we focus in the, usually it, uh, make a top-down approach for technology. That is in, the, in include three pillars. One is government, one is the industry, enterprise, business, and the other is the mass society for the citizen. So, uh, in terms of the uh, Asia, in the 10 member state, my impression is that it actually it has no uh, concrete survey yet, but I think the digital transformation status in Asian countries, I think is much better compared in the pillar of the society because uh, yeah, yeah, as uh, Mokta said, we are uh, Asian member state is large population, about 500, 600 million people. And we, we are young and very technology adaptive, very quick. So we can, uh, the, the, we are very digital citizen. You can adapt and use uh, very frequent and uh, adapt it quickly to the new technology, especially the digital uh, technology like uh, mobile, uh, uh, mobile, smartphone or uh, e-commerce. So I, I think that is very big plus for the, the growth potential, potential growth for the uh, our region. Uh, in terms of the government and in the industry, I think there's some sky of the limited uh, the current status, especially the government. I think even though the government is takes the, the charge, but uh, in terms of the digital transformation, we are just lagging behind the other two pillars. Business, especially the startup in reason, I think now we start up very quickly because I think the main, the key characteristic for young for, for, for the population, for the ASEAN council, member states, our young uh, generation. So we adapt very quickly to the, to the uh, technology, to the change, uh, to the trend of the world. So like the digital technology, I, we see many uh, startup, digital start, uh, company like uh, uh, Rap or uh, Gojek in Indonesia and in uh, Southeast, uh, in Singapore, you have their C like, uh, yeah. And even in our country as well, the many startup high tech company in AI as well. So I think that is, it shows the potential of the reason. But I think the, the lacking is a pillar in the government. I think that is the point. We as the adaptation of technology for government, I think is still the problem. It's a lacking behind, or the policy is still behind the realist, uh, the real, the practice, the right status. For the, uh, the second part about the cooperation between our uh, region with the uh, US, US and Korea. 
I think we actually have a very good uh, cooperation in digital technology with the two countries. Especially, I don't know much about the other uh, member states. But for Vietnam, we receive much support from uh, uh, Korea. The, our the government, the, now we call the digital government, or before we call the e-government of Vietnam, the, we receive much support from the government of Korea. So I think that's the point. But in the US, I we receive not much about the government, but I think the support in the industry and the mass, the society. So the, the US, I think is much better in terms of the, to the other two pillars in uh, business, in industry, as well as the mass society. For Korea, I think the Korea make a uh, good approach or support collaboration with the government sector in our country. And I think maybe may also in other member states as well. So that is the... Uh, and we hope that we can expand and utilize the advantage of the uh, mutual cooperation between the, the three uh, tenable states with the US and with the, uh, uh, and we can uh, promote for the better future or the, uh, utilize the potential benefit of the digital transformation for the whole region. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nguyen. Um, well, uh, we have shared uh, uh, three thoughts on the, the status of uh, um, digital transformation using AI and uh, uh, demand for cooperation with uh, uh, ROK and US. Now, now your turn, uh, ROK and US. <laughs> um, well, we, we all agree uh, data and digital technology is uh, those are all about um, digital transformation, uh, especially in AI field. Uh, data collection is the, the first step for using AI, I think. Um, can you um, introduce and explain the standards uh, do ROK in US have for privacy and uh, cybersecurity at the stage of uh, data collection? Um, who goes first? Uh, Mr. Uh, okay, Professor Yu. <laughs> oh, no, no. I, I was trying to say that. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I, I saw your. How about I go? Uh, I'll go ahead. Okay. Um, okay. okay. I, okay. Thank you. Since you the think... US is, it's such a simple story with the United States. Uh -huh. I'm sure I'll be done very quickly and I'll, I'll hand it over to Professor Yu in no time flat. Um, it, by the way, it's always good to be on a panel with another uh, Michigan alum. Go blue. Thank you for, uh, thank you for being here. I, um, Speaking, first off, I just want to commend uh, the ASEAN speakers just now. I, I could not have painted the picture better myself um, in terms of the incredible opportunities and challenges that ASEAN member states face in navigating um, what should be their role as a leading region in the development of critical and emerging technologies and AI, um, first and foremost among those. I just to underscore, you know, what we heard from the Secretariat and, and, and from Professor Marsudi, I think that um ASEAN United is a massive economic block with a young and, and just incredibly mobile first population that is ready to take advantage of technologies in ways that you do not see in many other parts of the world. So um, I was in Jakarta for one of my re more recent tours as Gojek and um, was transforming into GoTo. And you saw this sort of massive growth in the online economy. Um, and you saw what it could do for people's lives, whether you were a software engineer who studied the US and moved back to Jakarta to start a company, or you were a person who was driving, um, you know, working for GoTo or Gojek driving things around um, as you know, picking people up and dropping off food. It, it really transformed the economy. And there's just this tremendous opportunity. I, I would want to underscore that, you know, looking at, at ASEAN's future, um, the ability to integrate and share resources and data from a regulatory and then also a business standpoint is really going to be key to unlocking that potential. Um, so from a US perspective, what we're thinking about when we want to work with ASEAN is how do we create an interoperable ASEAN where Indonesian companies can work in Malaysia and Philippines and Thailand and Thai companies can work in Indonesia and elsewhere, um, taking advantage of the latest technologies like cloud computing, moving data just as easily as moving goods and training people to the highest standards so that entrepreneurs um, and innovators can really take off in the region. That's really what's driving our interest um, in cooperating with ASEAN and with uh, individual member states in the digital economy. 
Um, so you'll you'll see that reflected in programs we've had for a long time, um, working with Korea, uh, the Digital Economy Series, and the U.S. ASEAN Connect is one example, still alive, um, working on 5G and AI implementations. Um, you also see it in the 2021 Leader Statement, um, listing all of those initiatives uh, that were mentioned before in terms of master plans and, and plans for ASEAN digital transformation. And you see it in the future. I'll, I'll make one plug here for the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, where we see a lot of participation from ASEAN member economies. Um, and one of the underlying features of that is going to be capacity building and training driven by government and private sector players in places like Vietnam um, to help train government and private sector to really take advantage of a data-driven economy um, and to really make the most out of that trade initiative. So that's I guess if, if, if you take nothing else away from this panel from a U.S. perspective is that we are 100 percent committed to seeing you know, ASEAN thrive. Um, and it's just it's incredible to hear what you all have to say from Indonesia, um, you know, Malaysia, Vietnam and elsewhere, um, all these opportunities uh, that are developing. So it's, it's very encouraging from a U.S. perspective on data. You know, we our, our data privacy regulations are um, literally all over the map in the sense that we have extremely strong rules in things like uh, the Health Information Public Privacy and Portability Act, or HIPAA. Um, you also see a lot of our Bank Act uh, requirements are, are quite stringent um, for US citizen information, but you also don't see a generalized privacy statute. And so um, I think that's something that I know we're working on as a matter of domestic policy, and you see it in some of our, in our, in our states like California and New York, um, developing their own privacy rules. But I think that one thing you can take away from the US experience that might apply to ASEAN here is that we have a diversity of jurisdictions all following their own approach, um, but we're making sure the data moves from California to New York seamlessly. Um, it's still possible to start a company in Florida and recruit users in California, New York, Idaho, Montana. Um, and so if you do happen to grow in one part of the States, you can grow anywhere. And I think that that goes down to, even when we have these privacy regulations, we make sure that they are they don't get in the way of economic interoperability um, and, and allowing companies to operate relatively easily across borders without too many restraints. So that, that's something I would mention there. Um, happy to go into more detail on privacy rules, but I've probably gone on long enough. Let me hand over to Professor Yu uh, for thoughts on the Korean experience. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Yu? Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. It's glad to be here. And the I am a professor at the Computer Science Department in Korea University. As James mentioned, I studied in Michigan, University of Michigan, and I'm currently carrying out uh, two main projects. One is the um, AI, so-called AI infrastructure. So they are how you run, how, how you actually get the large scale AI models. Uh, the other projects that I'm engaged in is the, how do you make a, a digital health platform? So we have, Apple Watch and Samsung, Samsung Galaxy Watch. So how you can take advantage or exploit those watches for your health. So that's my background. Uh, before I go back, go to the um, data related question uh, for panelists, I just uh, give a quick my answer to Dr. Judina uh, that uh, my, uh, not because I'm a, I teach at university. I think one of the key aspects that uh, for uh, preparing for the digital transformation is to prepare young people. So that you need to train them properly so that they can engage into, you know, you know many different you know, part of industry. It can be finance, it can be health, health related or, you know, uh, telecommunications. So I think, you know, uh, Dr. Uh, I forgot, I mean, the Korea is working very close, closely with the Vietnam for the e-government. Um, as like that, you know, I suggest to, you know, Asian countries send, you know, young students, college students to, you know, to Korea and also United States with the government funding so that they can get proper training so that you know, when they're ready, they can contribute greatly for the trans, uh, digital transformation of Asian countries. So that's my short answer to, to the first question of uh, Julina. Also for the second part, I think the second part is very important because you know, uh, when this digital transformation happens, you know, there'll be a 
a larger degree of digital divide have don't have. So digital literacy is very important. So I think that's more the social, you know, aspect of the um, transformation. So I think that that requires a lot of, you know, you know, societal, you know, discussions and how each country can prepare for those such changes. Because these, these changes is, is not just that we're going to, you know, use mobile phone or you're going to use, you know, some PCs. It's not kind of that. It's going, it's going to be a huge difference in our lifestyle, the way we, we do things. So I think uh, it will be very important, crucial for Asian, Asian countries to prepare how to, you know, have a some kind of safe net for those, you know, big weaknesses or, you know, some of those who don't have access to such devices or such a training, okay? So that's my short question answer to your second question. And going to this data set side, you know, um, I mean, obviously data set is crucial for training, you know, deep learning models. And having a good data set is crucial. So, but the good news is that there are quite a few uh, data sets available for cybersecurity. So if I name a few, uh, there are some, Data sets for malware, uh, like you know, virus share and virus total and Commodore, all those companies have their malware data sets available. Uh, for example, uh, virus share has uh, 53 million samples of malwares. So if somebody, you know, in Asian countries want to build a model for you know cybersecurity, then it's a very good place to start. Okay. Also for the data set for intrusion, like a botnet kind of things. Also there are a good data set called the CTU13. Uh, it's a well-made data set uh, that so that you can publicly, you know, utilize the data set to train your models. Okay. And also, uh, you know, cybersecurity aspect, you know, um, there are some external attacks, but also internally, your insider can make something, you know, trouble, right? So there is some data set called the sort insider threat data set. Uh, that is a very synthetic data set, but uh, it has a system log of 516 days. And that includes about 130 million events. So it's a fairly extensive data set so that you, know, you can use the, you can you can use that kind of data set to train your AI models, and I believe I'm not sure James can comment on this, but United States government has some kind of impact cyber trust, uh, so they collect large number of you know traces, malwares, and all kind of cyber related you know uh, data sets and make a big pool. So I think Asian countries can try to access that. Uh, there may be some regulation and legal issues involved with it because you know those data sets may be, it may be you know confined to the United States. So maybe some kind of mutual. I mean, two countries make some kind of uh, agreement. And also from Korea, uh, we have a we have a government organization called KISA. They have about 800 million, uh, you know, malware data sets. So it's fairly extensive. It's a large number of data sets. So they can be, you know, I, I think it can be a good help if you can use it. But problem is that it also, you know, bound to the Korean law. So you know, I'm not sure how Korean law, law will uh, pan out to you know Asian countries. I think that's something that you guys need to bring up to your government and have talk have your government talk to Korean government so that you know tell you know Korean government that hey you know we heard that you have great data sets so we like to you know take use of it. Okay, so that can be a um, a good starting point for you know data collection side. And for the privacy, as James said, you know, there is not much of a standard as far as that I know. Uh, there are legal, you know, 
some you know issues. You know, privacy is very strictly you know guided by Korean law. So you know, I mean, we have we have the same issue. We have a similar issue that when we collect the health data from individual, we have to bound to some Korean laws. So uh, that's more legal issues. So I mean, maybe you know, Asian country needs to develop you know, internal and its own country, you know, legal system. Hey, and if I, if I may, um, apologies, just uh, because, because Dr. Yu mentioned the uh, uh, impact service, I, I put a link to um, the uh, Department of Homeland Security website um, that manages the cybersecurity impact data set. Um, oh, if anybody's yeah. interested, that provides a really good introduction. Um, okay. Some of those resources are, are free and open purely. Mm -hmm. Others are request and, and discuss and, and negotiated. So um, if anybody, my information should be available from this, this uh, conference. And so if there is a, an interest in connecting with DHS about those data sets for cybersecurity mm -hmm. and AI, um, I'm happy to act as a go-between to find the right person if you have any challenges there. Um, the only other thing I would note is that since 2009, we have had um, data.gov and kind of an open data policy um, so it is possible, maybe not for cybersecurity, but for um, oceanic and climate data, for a lot of NASA um, geospatial information and satellite data, um, and other types of census and, and public records, um, patent and trademark, intellectual property data. A lot of that is available free to anybody who wants to go to it online. Um, and so there are, you know, different data um, will be useful for different types of AI applications. And some of this is is absolutely open, and we try to make it available to uh, ASEAN partners in particular. Thank right. you, thank, thank you, James. Um, uh, you opened the the last questions uh, smoothly. <laughs> uh, well, since we have um, about eleven minutes left, uh, my last question goes to you all, and uh, I will allocate uh, two minutes each then I will wrap it up uh, the panel discussion session. Um, as James mentioned, as Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Yu has mentioned, we have, uh, well, uh, we have uh, noticed that well-established data sets uh, from uh, everywhere and it, um, it becomes uh, open to uh, everyone uh, for the uh, entire ecosystem. Uh, so in 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 this period of time, uh, cooperation between the ROK US and ASEAN uh, will be really really um, highlighted in terms of the uh, data collection and utilization. Uh, what do you think about uh, the uh, collaboration between uh, those three parties? On, on this uh, data collection and utilization uh, issues specifically. Um, let's uh, go to uh, Dr. Ng Yuan first. Yeah, thank you, yes, uh, Two minutes, please. <laughs> yeah, um, for the data collection, collaboration, uh, yeah, as I mentioned that uh, in the three pillars in the government, the business industry and the mass uh, society. Uh, uh, the data in this transformation is important. AI need data. So uh, uh, for the government, I think for the 10 member states, except Singapore, I think the other nine member states are still difficult in terms of the data collection. So uh, Recently, I think with the support, uh, with the uh, advice from the uh, Korean government in Vietnam, it, uh, it now it delegates the digital, software, uh, digital government by the term the open data. So the data set you can get from some partners, like the US or the Korea, but the data mostly specific to the US or the Korea. It may not suitable or uh, fit to the context of the Asian country or fit the context of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, now we try to uh, promote both the, the open data set from the US, the part of the US and the Korea, but also we have the open data. You get some 
so direct data with the, the last popular the, the penetration of the ratio of the uh, hand-hand device digital device we have the open data come from the, the citizen from the people in our country so this kind of data even though we need some kind of clean or pre-processing the data sometimes the data is corrupt sometimes it's noisy but we need some this kind of data is very useful for our daily activity for the society for the economy so i think uh, we uh, at the same time the data set open from the dss has, has them just the mention of even from the current government we need some kind of the guidance or support the technical uh, technology to clean the data with our own data the open data in our, from our own generate from our own people so i think that's much better so that is maybe the good idea in terms of from, from the technology. I'm from technology area, so I, my, my my suggestion would be on that uh, that topic as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Yu. Okay, um, I I agree with uh, Dr. Ng that uh, you know each country may have uh, differences in terms of data usage. So you know, but you know to into. I mean, data interoperability, you know, maybe Asian countries to, you know, you know, come up and bring up some kind of uh, stand, uh, standardization because, you know, data is uh, very highly fragmented, each country by country, you know, European countries, they have trouble with, because their data is not, I mean, especially medical data is not, you know, standardized at all. So I suggest that uh, you know Asian countries may you know bring may get together and come up with uh, some kind of standards. There there are some health health related standards that like HL seven. Maybe you know Asian countries join you know such you know such a standard organization to have all the you know the medical institutions and hospitals you know use the same code for diseases and the same data. I think that's that will be good for the future, for the AI and go for the digital health in general. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Professor Yu. Uh, Dr. Musudi, Marsudi, Dr. Marsudi. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, just like what Professor you mentioned, that different country they will have different approaches. Then uh, that's why, for instance, in in the case of smart city, for instance. Indonesia, we develop our own smart city approach. We don't use ITU approach because ITU, ITU approach is not applicable in Indonesia, right. Indonesian culture. The same as uh, digital transformation that I've just uh, shown before, because uh, the, the Western approach is not applicable to Indonesian uh, business culture. So that's why we develop uh, different uh, approach. So regarding the data, uh, let's say uh, for security data in Indonesia, the highest security incidence is not malware, but social engineering. So maybe you will not believe that in Indonesia there are a lot of people being hypnotized, and uh, that's the uh, be becoming the entrance uh, tools to to do a security breach by hypnotizing people, mm -hmm. and that maybe doesn't happen in in, in the US. Uh, so in in that case, in my opinion, if we talk about data. Uh, of course, we have data that is common that everyone can can use. For instance, climate data, climate change data, uh, pandemic, uh, disease, and things like that. But there are also some very specific data that we we must be very careful. For instance, regarding privacy and things like that. So, in my opinion, uh, uh, we can do a lot of uh, cooperation in those data that uh, is common to everyone and also open. And this is important also, for instance, uh, climate change data, uh, satellite data. We need to predict, for instance, when will, uh, what will happen with the rain in the next uh, month, for instance. What will happen with the, uh, uh, because it, it relates, with, relates with our farmer, for instance. And we can get the data from uh, uh, the, the sites that was mentioned by James from the US, for instance. And also for, for another example is, for pandemic, we have uh, we have been using a lot of pandemic model from the US to predict the COVID nineteen spread, and this is also useful. So that's in my opinion, we can do a lot of cooperation in the data that doesn't uh, involve any issues with privacy, especially with people. Thank you. 
Thank you. James, your turn. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. Uh, good opportunity to, to talk a little bit about some of these issues. I'd say for data, um, if, if anyone was around for my presentation this morning, I talked about the importance of privacy enhancing technologies and looking for ways to um, maximize the value of data um, while protecting individual um, information that might be regulated, whether it's GDPR, whatever Indonesia's regulations are going to look like, whatever the US regulations look like. Um, so that's one thing I would, I would consider. I would say most important for government regulators is to live in a world where you want to see data shared, if at all possible. Um, it's very easy to say, don't share, it's private and keep it in a server someplace, lock it in a computer, put that computer under a desk, don't share. Um, you'll never have a privacy violation that way unless it gets hacked, but you also completely lose the value of that data. And so you need, we as regulators need to find ways to share. We need to push ourselves to share, embrace technologies that let us get the full value of the data. And then if we do need to regulate, um, maybe this is just a US perspective, but I would say that something that is done in consultation with businesses that allows um, data users, researchers, companies, individuals to share data and, and really innovate um, without having to be tied down too much by very stringent regulations, I think is best. Um, one thing I would recommend people take a look at is for example, the APEC cross-border privacy regime, um, CBPR, um, which is something that is being launched globally now and provides a more flexible approach, I think, to data regulation that allows, say, in Indonesia or Malaysia or others to um, adopt certain basic standards, adopt certain trust marks, and then encourage businesses to demonstrate that they are trustworthy to their clients rather than something that's a little bit more of a heavy mandate. So I would suggest that as well. Thank you, James. Uh, Dr. Mokta? Yes, so thank you so much. <laughs> I'll try to do it in two minutes. So we okay. at the Asan Secretariat Science and Technology Division, uh, we actually we've been already collaborating with our partners in jointly collecting, uh, utilizing management inventory for various type and magnitude of data. To some extent, um, AI is already being incorporated throughout the process. Examples of the data that we collected and utilized together with our um, subcommittees are meteorological and geophysics data, uh, space technology application data, biotech data, COVID-19 related data, uh, to name a few. I think uh, Prof. Marsudi already highlighted this earlier. So I honestly uh, do not think that we are able to crunch all this big data or do simulation without machine learning and AI. That being said, I, I echo what Aduk Tenguyen said, AI needs data and in reverse, data needs AI. Data is the fuel of our new economy. So when we are talking about data collection, it will require um, data pooling, scrapping, capturing, and of course, some in the end loading from various sources. Big data or the high volumes of data collection or data creation can be uh, challenging at the national level. And what more to say when we're doing it at the regional level or country to country on data collection. What we have at the ASEAN Secretariat is the um, ASEAN Data Management Framework, outlining the data governance and protection throughout the whole um, data life cycle. Uh, this framework sets out to um, the strategic priorities, uh, principles and initiative to guide member states in their uh, policy and regulatory approaches towards uh, digital data governance in the digital economy, including data collection and data utilization. So I think um, earlier all panelists mentioned about the fact that different countries require different approaches. That is why uh, this framework is designed in a way to provide voluntary and non-binding guidance based on the best practices in the area of um, data management. And of course, this can be harmonized and synergized with existing digital um, data governance policies at the national level. So going back to your question, how can uh, Korea and US support um, ASEAN's um, joint data collection and utilization? I would say that um, this can be done on a case-to-case -case basis, uh, depending on the need for joint data collection and utilization. Usually one of the first steps um, to, that we usually come out with is to develop the term of reference, the TOR, and agree on the mechanisms. I take note on the some of the very valuable things pointed out by uh, Dr. Servan on the um, potential uh, to work together on um, data-driven economy with the US or learn from the US best practices on the data privacy rules and regulations, as well as the um, data set on security and AI. Um, I also take note on the um, profile uh, to prepare 
uh, the young people uh, properly so that they can engage in the digital economy. Uh, just to share with everyone that as we speak right now, at the ASEAN Secretariat, we're developing a platform uh, to upskill and reskill our ASEAN community, both young and old, to embrace YR, also to focus on providing safety needs uh, for the have-nots. So I think um, in summary, uh, we at the ASEAN Secretariat, um, we really welcome initiative related to AI, um, supported uh, by several sectoral bodies. So the entry points for collaboration um, uh, for us are usually through several divisions. Our division, the Science and Technology Division. Another division is the, um, the Digital Economy Division. And the last one would be um, the Analysis and Monitoring on Trade, Industry and Emerging Issue Division. We would certainly welcome uh, science diplomacy on AI-related collaboration with mutual benefits with all partners, especially the US and Korea. Thank you. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Thank you very much for you all. Uh, well, time is over now. Uh, thank you very much for the participating uh, for the panelists. And uh, we have shared uh, so many information and so many uh, thoughtful insight um, on the data collection and use, uh, AI and uh, digital transformation. I hope everyone um, can get some uh, great ideas for the new collaboration uh, between those three parties. Uh, no, not, not three parties, 13 parties <laughs> here. Um, and thank you again. Thank, uh, and uh, I hope to see you soon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Kim, for leading the very constructive session of the discussion today uh, of the possibility for ASEAN member states to engage with uh, Republic of Korea and as well as the United States. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, we are moving to the next session. It will be a breakout session for the workshop on artificial intelligence implementation. There are two sessions that will be delivered today. For the session A will be artificial intelligence implementation on energy security. And the session B is will be artificial intelligence implementation on agriculture. We have created the um, breakout rooms uh, on Zoom. So for both participants, uh, both virtual and in-person participants, you may join. Uh, to your intent um, topics. It will be energy security and agriculture at this moment uh, from 1, oh, sorry, from uh, 2 p.m. until um, approximately 4.30 p.m. So for um, in-person participation, you may join uh, a session of agriculture in the, in the room of Alamanda in the second floor. However, if you intend and wish to join the agriculture in the um, virtual room, you may uh, enter the breakout room, session B. It is an agriculture. So I repeat, if you wish to join the energy security, you may join the session A breakout room uh, on the virtual and your Zoom platform. And if you wish to join agriculture, you, uh, you may join the session B. Otherwise you can chat the uh, host and um identify which 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 session that you will prefer to 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 join so so the host will uh, assist you to join the breakout session as well so for in person participant if you wish to join the agriculture session you may um, continue to the breakout room at the alamanda room at the second floor
and this room is especially for the energy security session discussion. Okay, once again, I'd like to, to <laughs> announce that we have created two breakout rooms for online participation. So there are session A, it's AI. It's, it's an AI on energy security and for the session B. Yes. Uh, session B, I repeat, Session B, it's artificial intelligence on agriculture. So if you wish to join your intended topics, kindly just push on the breakout rooms and choose the topic that you are interested in. Maybe uh, I saw there's a request on the chat room that he intend to join <laughs> cyber security if i'm not mistaken okay please mute it wait Maybe for both room will be started in uh, in five minutes, waiting for other participant to choose uh, their intended topics for the discussion and for the workshop as well. Okay, repeat. You may join uh, both breakout rooms, energy security or agriculture. You may choose uh, one of your intended topics in the breakout room. And you, if you have found any difficulties, please just chat uh, through the chat platform on the Zoom. Uh, the house will assist you to uh, to assist you to join the intended room that you, you prefer. So another another uh, information that the moderator for the uh, energy security session will be Dr. Jamie Mulyadi, and the moderator for the agriculture will be Dr. Lindung Parningotan Manik. Well, wishing you having a fruitful discussion. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, we will start the station for artificial intelligence implementation on NFT security. I would like to invite Dr. Jim as a moderator as a lead the session on the stage. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Denny, the time is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Henry. Thank you, Dr. Denny. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished lecturers, uh, the head of uh, organization research for electronics and informatics, Mr. Budi, uh, the head of these are centers for artificial intelligence and uh, cyber security in Toronto and uh, the leaders in three uh, uh, executives again good afternoon uh, in this uh, in this occasion I was uh, given the chances to the moderator on the session for artificial intelligence implementation on energy security. In this session, uh, I will try to host four of our uh, experts as a speaker from Dr. William Sobianto Budir, Dr. Muhammad Sobianto. <laughs> Mr. Bagus Imam Darawan and Dr. Kampanat Kisalya. Okay, I think uh, this is a small introductory about me. I'm Jimmy Muriadi. Uh, I'm working at BRIN, uh, the Indonesian Agency for Research and Innovation, especially in the province especially in uh, PRK KS or Research Center for Artificial Intelligence and Cyber Security. Uh, so I will be uh, directly to uh, moderate our discussion. Uh, we shall begin with this, our first speaker, Dr. Buyung Sobianto Munir. Uh, Dr. Bruno, um, uh, I was uh, trying to uh, know about Dr. Bruno, and I see that Dr. Bruno has this dissertation on real time pattern recognition of phaser data. Dr. Bruno graduated from the computer science at 2019. Um, he has various of publication. Okay, thank you from committee. Um, oh yeah, this is uh, the complete educational background of Dr. Bing from bachelor, master, and doctoral degree from uh, electrical engineering in bachelor and master and computer science yeah. and doctoral degree. Has a work experience in PLM, the six electrical company. Mm -hmm. 